Jack. Mike one.
We'll now come to order. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, all the witnesses for attending this very important hearing today on pipeline safety and security. And I want to welcome all of our distinguished uh, panelists and that will be appearing before us today on two separate panels. And I also want to express my uh, disappointment and my deep-seated concern that we will not be hearing from one of the agencies responsible for oversight of pipeline safety, TSA, who actually preside over some of the most disturbing and outstanding issues that need to be addressed by the members of this subcommittee. While we did invite TSA to appear before us today so that the members of this subcommittee could address many of the issues that were spelled out in the December 2018 GAO report, TSA declined to send a witness and frankly, I find it to be unacceptable and that it will be addressed as we move forward. Uh, TSA needs to ask some uh, striking questions that we have, uh, that members of this subcommittee uh, have and want to get answers to. In the meantime, I look forward to engaging uh, with the panelists uh, that are present with us today uh, examining the state of pipeline safety and security uh, as it currently stands uh, before the nation. I have the pleasure of representing portions of Will County, uh, Illinois, as part of the first congressional district of Illinois. And Will County has a dubious distinction uh, of accounting for 8% of all the pipelines in my state. And, if, and officials there were able to provide my office with critical insight into how 
pipeline safety and security protocols play out on the local level. As we all know, local communities are always the ones most directly impacted when something goes wrong with America's pipeline. And as we unfortunately witness far too often in areas extending from Merrimack Valley in, in Massachusetts to Aliso Canyon and San Bruno in California. From county first responders who were actually the initial actors on the scene to uh, local emergency management agencies who are required to participate and carry out emergency preparedness exercises to plan and prepare for disasters. Local agencies play a huge role in helping to mitigate disasters, and they're not always provided with the adequate funding or resources to do the job which we require of them. Many times, when private companies are mandated by federal law to comply with consent decrees, they pull in local resources, such as was the case with a recent spill in Romeoville, Illinois. Will County officials were required to contribute many hours of manpower and staff in order to help Embridge meet its court ordered and decree, but they were not compensated any money for this huge responsibility that they had to accept. While there is the hazardous materials emergency preparedness, the MHELP, NHELP, HMAP grant program, it appears that there are some severe limitations upon this program. Uh, the HMEP or TAG program operates with limited and unpredictable levels of funding and has burdensome restrictions on how that funding may be utilized. I look forward to today's hearing and to a uh, robust discussion on both sides of the issue uh, of this outstanding and uh, priority issue that's before us. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. And now I recognize my friend and colleague, uh, my friend from Michigan, Ranking Member Upton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also my friend for sure. Uh, this is an important hearing as we begin our work to reauthorize the nation's pipeline safety laws. I want to thank you for making this a bipartisan effort, for working with us to select the witnesses and prepare for the hearing. And we have a great track record when we work together from the very start, especially when it involves public safety. You know, throughout my time in Congress, I've especially prioritized pipeline safety. It's personal, uh, as it, we had to deal with a bad pipeline accident in my home state. I recall the 2010 oil spill in the Kalamazoo River, not too far from my district, which led to the passage of the Upton Dingle Pipeline Safety Bill in 2012. And in response to the Kalamazoo spill specifically, we cut down on the incident reporting time, 24 hours now, and we upped the financial penalty for violations. In 2016, we came together again to pass another bipartisan pipeline safety bill, which now is set to expire in October. I'm proud of the work that we accomplished with that bill, particularly the language that I was able to include requiring mandatory annual inspections for certain pipeline crossings, such as the Embridge Line 5, which crosses the Straits of Mackinac at a depth of more than 250 feet below the surface of the water that was built some 60 years ago. Mr. Chairman, as we turn to this upcoming reauthorization, I know that and I'm grateful for the commitment from you to adopt the same bipartisan formula that worked so well the last two times as we did pipeline safety. I'm confident that today's hearing will provide us with a good start. We have two panels offering a diverse range of views, including the administrator of PHMSA, commissioner from the Ohio Public Utility Commission, and a representative from the GAO, representatives of oil and gas pipeline operators and pipeline safety advocates. And as one can tell from the witness lineup, and I'll 
An effective pipeline safety and security program requires communication and cooperation among a wide array of stakeholders. Today's hearing will also allow members to examine GAO's recommendations to address significant weaknesses in TSA's pipeline security program management. I'll confess that I was most disappointed to learn that while TSA was invited to participate in today's hearing, they officially declined to appear. And I guess you could say like the Alamo, we're gonna remember that. We know from the committee's oversight that TSA staffing issues are a major limitation. TSA has some 50,000 employees, only a handful, actually it's a handful plus one, six are assigned to pipeline safety. That's not very good. Strengthening cybersecurity for pipeline is, is an issue that I care deeply about, and I believe that Congress does need to act in both the House and the Senate. Uh, I've introduced a bill, H.R. 370, the Pipeline and LNG Facility Cybersecurity Preparedness Act, that would help address some of the vulnerabilities outlined in the GAO report. And although my bill is more focused on DOE's role as the sector-specific agency for energy, I'm committed to getting it over the finish line and I'm open-minded about ways to strengthen cybersecurity through our pipeline safety reauthorization bill. And I know that we can make it bipartisan. So at the end of the day, we cannot separate pipeline safety from pipeline security. And we cannot allow agencies to carry out a turf war over jurisdiction, especially if they're gonna refuse to come before this important committee. That, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for holding the hearing, and I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are millions of miles of pipeline transporting natural gas, oil, and other commodities across the country, and when a pipeline fails, it can be destructive and even deadly. Late last year, a failure in Massachusetts's Merrimack Valley caused one death, 21 injuries, and damage to over 130 homes. In February, a gas fuel explosion at a residence in Dallas, Texas, killed a 12-year-old and injured his family. And these tragic events underscore the need for a strong federal safety pipeline program. And I want to welcome Skip Elliott, Administrator of the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, uh, pronounced FISMA, no, yeah, FISA. <laughs> FIMSA, FIMSA, to the committee. <laughs> Administrator Elliott, I wish you success in your effort to manage an agency notorious for its inability to meet congressionally mandated deadlines and carry out its mission in an efficient and effective way. And certainly there are dedicated <coughs> career staff at, FIS, at FIMSA who work hard to make our pipeline safer, safer, but there are too many outstanding mandates from the 2011 and 2016 pipeline safety reauthorizations that FIMSA has failed to finalize, and that's unacceptable. As part of the 2011 reauthorization, Congress required the use of automatic or remote-controlled shutoff valves on newly constructed transmission pipelines to limit damage when a rupture occurred, and the National Transportation Safety Board recommended use of this technology 25 years ago after a pipeline explosion in my congressional district in Edison, New Jersey. I was in Congress then, and yet here we are still discussing the same issue. The 2011 law also required operators to install leak detection systems on hazardous liquid pipelines, but eight years later, uh, FIMSA uh, still has not finalized a rule. And in what I consider to be the most important provision of the 2016 reauthorization, Congress gave uh, FIMSA emergency order authority to address imminent industry-wide safety hazards that pose a threat to life or significant harm to property or the environment. Yet FIMSA has failed to implement this too. And it's not all FIMSA's fault. The prescriptive cost-benefit analysis required by the 96 reauthorization hamstrungs the agency. If we want FIMSA to finalize more rulemakings, we must remove or adjust this overly burdensome requirement. And we also need to restore the mechanisms for citizens to pursue legal action to compel FIMSA to fulfill its statutory duties. If the federal government can or will not carry out its mandated responsibilities, citizens should have the right to take legal action. 
in the aftermath of the 2010 San Bruno pipeline explosion that killed eight people, San Francisco sued the federal government for having abjectly failed to enforce safety standards. Unfortunately, the courts dismissed that suit because it found that the law did not permit mandamus-type citizen suits against the government. And that was never Congress's intent, and it must, uh, it must change. I'm also extremely disappointed, as, uh, as um, my colleague from Michigan said, that the Transportation Security Administration Administrator David Pekoski refused to testify or even send a witness today. And on a bipartisan basis, we invited TSA to testify in its pipeline security program, which the Government Accounting Office has criticized for having significant weaknesses. I'm concerned that TSA lacks the resources, expertise in energy delivery systems, and frankly, the commitment to keep up its uh, obligations uh, under the law. And so, Fred, I want, Fred, I want to thank you for, for pointing that out, too. There was a serious security breach last week when someone shot at the Magellan Pipeline in Minnesota, causing a release of over 8,000 gallons of diesel fuel. If TSA can't be bothered to be here to discuss this security breach and justify its performance to Congress, then perhaps it's time we look for another federal agency other than TSA to handle this critical responsibility. And finally, I'd like to thank Carl Weimer for all of his help over the years to this committee in Congress, because I'm told he will soon step down as executive director of the Pipeline Safety Trust. Uh, 20 years ago next month, the Olympic gasoline, gasoline pipeline exploded in Bellingham, Washington, and that killed 18-year-old Liam Wood and two 10-year-olds, Wade King and Stephen Zivoris, or Ziorvis. And I say their names because it's critical that we not forget these kids. Since then, Carl and the Trust have taken the outrage of that event and used it to improve the pipeline safety landscape to the benefit of all of us. And, you know, again, we, 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 the, the role of citizens, the role of individuals in drawing attention to this, uh, to what needs to be done here is very important, and I certainly want to highlight that. Uh, the Pipeline Safety Act reauthorization has typically been a bipartisan effort, and we look forward to continue working with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to update and, and improve this critical federal program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full uh, committee, uh, Mr. Walden, for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Thanks for having this hearing. Uh, I think it's really important that we work together to reauthorize and modernize the nation's pipeline safety program. This is really an important hearing, and I'm pleased that we're beginning this process on a bipartisan basis, Mr. Chairman which is the tradition of the Energy and Commerce Committee on matters relating to pipeline safety and security. Federal government acting through the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, known as FEMSA, has an important responsibility to develop and enforce regulations for the safe, reliable, and environmentally sound operation of the nation's 2.7 million miles of pipelines. Pipelines are among the safest and most efficient ways to transport critical fuels and feedstocks, such as natural gas and petroleum, to our homes and businesses. And simply put, the safe operation of our nation's pipeline safety system is essential to help keep prices low for consumers and drive our economy forward in a positive direction. FEMSA cannot do this important job by itself. It must coordinate effectively with other federal agencies, such as the Department of Energy, FERC, and TSA, and especially with the states. In fact, it's important to recognize that much of the responsibility for pipeline safety falls on the states. It's often state pipeline safety workers who are on the front lines inspecting and enforcing safety requirements. And in many cases, it's also the state's responsibilities to regulate rates and ensure the adequate investments are made in pipeline maintenance and modernization. But as members of Congress, it is our responsibility to ensure that FEMSA and the states have enough resources and the appropriate tools to get the job done. With FEMSA's authorization expiring at the end of this fiscal year, it's time for us to get our work done. As we turn to reauthorization, I'll remain focused on protecting public safety and consumers. These are not mutually exclusive goals, and I'm optimistic we can find bipartisan agreement, as we always have, when it comes to pipeline safety. Mr. Chairman, I hope we can get a commitment to work together on the drafting process from the very beginning. That, that would really be consistent with our practice from the last round of reauthorization. I think it would contribute toward a better quality work product, so I hope we can do that. There are many areas where I believe we can update and strengthen the law to drive innovation and lower the barrier of entry for new technologies. New technologies for pipeline construction and integrity management can help improve efficiency and safety at the same time. 
I also believe we should examine recent pipeline safety incidents and incorporate lessons learned in our work. We should also make sure to provide FEMSA with clear directions, recognizing they already have a backlog of congressional mandates and are working on two high-priority rules for both gas and liquid pipelines. FEMSA must also finish its work on other important safety rules relating to pipeline valves and rupture detection, integrity management, class location, and public education and awareness. I believe FEMSA is on the right track, and I look forward to the agency completing this important work. At this point, I'll close by thanking our witnesses for appearing before us today. We're going to hear a range of perspectives to help inform our work, including FEMSA, the State of Ohio, pipeline operators, and safety advocates. We're also going to examine the findings of a recent GAO report, which raises numerous serious concerns about the effectiveness of the Transportation Security Administration's pipeline cyber security program. As the Committee of Jurisdiction for Energy and Interstate Commerce, and let me say this very clearly, I am very disappointed that TSA refused to provide a witness for today's hearing. And I would urge this administration, in the strongest terms possible, to cooperate with our committee and respond to what I believe are legitimate oversight requests relating to pipeline safety and security. With that, Mr. Chairman, thanks again for holding the hearing. I yield back the balance of my time. The Chair, I want to thank the gentleman uh, for his opening statement and reassure him that uh, our side is eager to work with you on a bipartisan basis to address all the issues on which we are mutually concerned about. Well, thank you. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall, may be, shall be made part of, of the record. And now we will we'll proceed to the witnesses opening statement, uh, beginning with panel one. And I will now like to introduce our first panel of witnesses for today's hearing. The uh, individual to uh, my left is the distinguished Honorable Howard R. Elliott, Administrator for the Pipeline and Safety Materials Safety Administration, FEMSA. Next to uh, Mr. Elliott is Mr. W. William Russell, the acting director of GAO. And uh, next to him is Commissioner Lawrence Friedman, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, Commissioner for the great state of uh, Buckeye State, the state of Ohio. And I want to say that we thank all of our witnesses for being with us today, and we look forward to your testimony. Uh, let me take a moment just to uh, let you know that I will recognize you for five minutes to provide opening statements. Before we begin, I would like to explain uh, the lighting system that is before you. In front of you is a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. And so with that said, um, Administrator Elliott, welcome, and we recognize you for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Ranking Member Walden, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton and esteemed members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I look forward to updating the subcommittee on the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration for progress in closing open congressional mandates and in executing our broader safety mission. Let me first say that I understand the frustrations that have been expressed regarding the outstanding congressional mandates on pipelines and hazardous material safety. We're working hard to ensure our nation's pipeline system remains safe and finalizing the mandates remains a top priority for FEMSA. Of the 11 remaining mandates from the 2011 and 2016 Pipeline Safety Acts, there were 61 in total. Three are tied to reports and other actions and the remaining eight are tied to in-progress rulemaking efforts. Those mandates from the 2011 Act, the ones that have been open the longest, are being addressed by three of FEMSA's current rulemakings for gas transmission pipelines, hazardous liquid pipelines, and rupture detection and valves. 
PHMSA continues to make progress on these rules. The liquid pipeline safety rule moved out of DOT for final review several months ago. We've also completed our work on the gas transmission pipeline final rule and the valve and rupture detection rule, and these rules are both undergoing internal review at DOT. I understand that many of you and many of our stakeholders may feel like we're not moving fast enough on our rulemakings. As a safety practitioner, I appreciate and I fully share those comments. As FIMS administrator, it's my responsibility to prioritize and pursue those rulemakings that will provide the greatest safety impact and have the highest likelihood of preventing events that could negatively impact people in the environment. To that end, I refer the members of this subcommittee to my written testimony regarding details of two completed safety congressional mandates dealing with comprehensive oil spill response plans for railroads and the transport of lithium ion batteries by air. In addition, we issued a final rule to modernize technologies for plastic pipelines that we hope will further accelerate aging distribution gas line replacements, which is one of the greatest concerns we have at FIMSA. In addition to congressional mandates and many mandates, many of FIMSA's rules must also address recommendations from the National Transportation Safety Board, the Government Accountability Office, and our own safety concerns. FIMSA is working to meet the needs of our expanding domestic energy production as well. In August of 2018, FIMSA established a new memorandum of understanding with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that eliminates unnecessary and duplicative regulatory reviews by both agencies. Going forward, FIMSA will operate as the federal government's LNG safety authority. To date, FIMSA has issued approximately 10 letters of determination for new LNG facilities. FIMSA has also established a team of cross-agency experts that are updating the LNG facility safety standards that date back to 1980. In addition, FIMSA continues to work to ensure that the agency has a full complement of field inspectors and headquarters staff to meet the demands of our safety mission. Safety is the highest priority for the U.S. Department of Transportation and for all of us at FIMSA. I'm pleased to say that while making progress on mandates, FIMSA's oversight role is continuing to have a positive impact on safety. Our integrity management required requirements have led pipeline operators to conduct over 90,000 repairs in high consequence areas. Our field efforts are having an impact too. Last year, FIMSA conducted over 12,000 days of inspections and investigations of pipeline systems. These field activities are helping to improve safety as evidenced in the number of reported pipeline incidents, which for 2018 was below the five-year average, even with FIMSA's expanded regulatory oversight of underground natural gas storage facilities. Additionally, both pipeline-related fatalities and the net volume spilled from hazardous liquid pipelines was also below the five-year average, down 33% and 21% respectively. Although we know that even one pipeline casualty is one too many. These facts, while notable, do not give me reason to pause during our ongoing safety mission at FIMSA. And even though we use statistics to help us measure improvements in safety, it's the vivid reminder in places like Bellingham, Marshall, San Bruno, Aliso Canyon, Merrimack Valley, and most recently Durham, North Carolina, that serve as our motivation and commitment for working even harder to improve pipeline safety. Thank you again for inviting me to today's hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I want to thank you, um, Administrator Elliott. And now, we're we'll in the committee, we we'll recognize Mr. Russell for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Rush, mm -hmm. Ranking Member Upton, Ranking Member Walden, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the state of pipeline safety and security in America and TSA's pipeline security program. My statement is based primarily on our recent December 2018 report. As you know, more than 2.7 million miles of pipelines transport oil, natural gas, and other hazardous liquids that we all depend on to heat homes, generate electricity, and manufacture products. Pipelines serve as the veins of our economy and run through both remote and highly populated urban areas. As a result, our pipeline network is a prime target for terrorists, foreign nations, and others with malicious intent to do physical and cyber attacks. 
A successful pipeline attack could have dire consequences on public health and safety, as well as the U.S. economy. The Transportation Security Administration, TSA, is the lead agency to ensure the security of our pipeline network. And in our recent report, we found that TSA provided pipeline operators with voluntary guidelines to enhance the security of their facilities. Pipeline operators and industry associations also reported they effectively coordinated and exchanged security information with TSA. That said, we identified a number of weaknesses in TSA's management of its pipeline security program, and I'd like to highlight four key areas for improvement. First, pipeline security guidance itself. It's important for TSA to ensure that its security guidelines, which were updated in 2018, March of 2018, that they clearly define how to determine the criticality of a pipeline facility. As a result, pipeline operators may not be fully reporting all of their critical facilities so that TSA can apply appropriate oversight and ensure that any vulnerabilities have been addressed. Second, workforce planning. TSA also needs to better evaluate the number of staff and resources that it devotes to pipeline security. For example, in our review, we found that staffing was as low as one person in 2014 and has since increased to a total of six FTEs. Establishing a strategic workforce plan could help TSA ensure that it has identified the necessary skills, competencies, and staffing allocations that the pipeline security branch needs to carry out its full responsibilities, including conducting necessary reviews of pipeline companies and facilities. Third, assessing risk. TSA uses throughput and risk to identify the top 100 most critical pipeline operators for review, but has not updated the assessment methodology since 2014 to account for changes in the threat environment. For example, threats to cybersecurity were not specifically accounted for, making it unclear if cybersecurity threats were considered. Last, effective monitoring. While we found that TSA does conduct pipeline operator and facility security oversight reviews, and makes recommendations to address issues found, it has not tracked and documented the implementation of those recommendations for over five years. Until TSA monitors and records the status of pipeline operator progress to implement needed changes, it will be hindered in its efforts to determine whether its reviews are in fact leading to a significant reduction in risk. We made a total of 10 recommendations to address these issues. I'm happy to report that TSA agreed with all of them and has actions underway to address them largely in this fiscal year. In conclusion, robust security of our pipeline system is vital to our economic interests and to mitigate the risks of a malicious attack. TSA has an important role in this process and by implementing the changes can more effectively carry out this mission. Ranking Member Rush, uh, our Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton and Ranking Member Walden, this concludes my prepared remarks, and I look forward to any questions you may have. The witness for this opening statement, and now the chair recognizes Commissioner Friedman uh, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning, uh, Chairman Rush, Chairman Pallone, Vice Chair McNerney, Republican Leader Upton, Republican Leader Walden, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning as well as thanks to the other members of the subcommittee. My name is Larry Friedman. I'm a commissioner at the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, known as the PUCO. Each day as I pass through the PUCO's lobby, I'm reminded of our mission statement, and that is to provide adequate, safe, fairly priced, and reliable utility services to the Ohio citizens. In short, we are to promote the general welfare by assuring the provision of essential services to all Ohioans. Implicit in the mandate is not only the need to establish service, but just as importantly, to maintain the provision of safe utility services over time. Pipeline safety integrity is a foundational element of utility service upon which all Ohio citizens rely, and there's no higher consideration within the context of pipeline transmission and distribution than that of public safety. Ohio has a robust public safety, pipeline safety program dedicated to the ensuring the safety and reliability of natural gas service to Ohioans. We have 113 natural gas pipeline operators and more than 71,000 miles of transmission, distribution, and gathering lines. 
Ohio was one of eight states that act as interstate agents for the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, FIMSA, and has done so since 1973. We have 12 interstate pipeline operators with over 8,500 miles of regulated interstate transmission lines. While these pipelines are located within the, the, the boundaries of the state of Ohio, the PUCO does not exercise jurisdiction over them. But pursuant to an agency agreement with FIMSA, the PUCO inspects interstate natural gas pipeline systems based on an, ins an inspection plan agreed to with FIMSA. It investigates incidents and refers any rules of enforcement identified to FIMSA for disposition. Ohio also receives funding from FINSA pursuant to the State Pipeline Safety Program Base Grant. This is a reimbursement-based grant authorized to support up to 80% of a state's cost to administer a gas pipeline safety program. In order to qualify, each state's program must comply with FINSA requirements. We are proud to say that for the last two years, Ohio's program has received the maximum score available on those annual audits conducted by FIBSA. Uh, yet in 2018, notwithstanding the maximum score, Ohio received not 80%, but 72.16% of expenses incurred. The Ohio program has 10 inspectors, performs over 150 audits annually, and they are primarily focused on pipeline distribution facilities. Ohio has built and maintained its safety pro pipeline safety program in no small measure because of the assistance received pursuant to the FIMSA uh, Pipeline Safety Program base grant. Through the years, the program has enabled the PUCO to hire, retain, and train uh, properly its staff. The training occurs at a FIMSA training center in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Now, complementary to the FIMSA-related activities, the state of Ohio has undertaken some independent initiatives uh, that I think worth mentioning. More than a decade ago, the PUCO, in cooperation with Ohio's major natural gas utilities, embarked on a capital investment program to replace bare steel and cast iron distribution pipes. The purpose of the program is to replace the pipes with upgraded materials, which not only enhance the structural integrity of the system, but prolong the useful life of the system. It is not only remedial, but preventative in nature. Since the inception of the program, Ohio's four largest investor-owned natural gas utilities have invested over $3.6 billion in replacement and have replaced over 5,000 miles of distribution mainline and more than 1 million service lines. The progress and value of the program is perhaps best manifested by the fact that at the end of 2010, about 20 percent of the total pipeline fell within categories targeted for replacement. At the end of 2018, that percentage has been reduced to 12. It's an inescapably long program in duration, but the PUCO has ordered accelerated cost recovery to incentivize accelerated replacement rather than authorizing recovery at more typical uh, regulatory paradigm structures. Uh, in conclusion, I, I recount the Ohio State-specific activities, in addition to the FIMSA-related activities, to help demonstrate the sheer magnitude of the imp compelling importance and desirability of federal state cooperation and coordination in enhancing the structural integrity of the natural gas transmission distribution system. Deliverability, reliability, and most importantly, safety are wholly dependent on effective pipeline safety measures. I would strongly urge the subcommittee's continuing support for safety reauthorization, and more specifically, I would urge your consideration of increasing the total reimbursement to the full 80 percent as authorized by Congress. Thank you so very much for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Chair, sure, thank all the witnesses for their opening statements. And we have now concluded the opening statements. We will now move to members' questions. And each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. <clears throat> Administrator Elliott, there are quite a few issues that I would like to discuss with you, but as I said, I only have five minutes to do so, and uh, therefore I'll set additional questions in writing to you uh, regarding the timeline for, for when FEMSA expects to complete its congressionally mandated rulemaking. 
that transmittal will be coming to you soon. And I would also like to hear back from your agency on some of its workforce issues. Specifically, I would like to hear whether or not FEMSA uh, does indeed have all the sufficient number of professional staff with the right expertise uh, to handle all those res responsibilities that fall under the agency's, agency's jurisdiction, including conducting uh, timely pipeline inspections and finalizing its rule making. Uh, one topic, though, that I would like to discuss with you at this time is the issue I spoke about in my opening uh, statement. How do we get more funding and assistance to the state and local level in order to help emergency management agencies and first responders with the resources they need desperately to fully and effectively carry out their duties. Uh, also, is there a defined obligation on the part of pipeline operators to work with county level emergency managers to develop and maintain emergency preparedness plans before an event or an exercise uh, occurs? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for those questions, and I'll try to answer them uh, in the order they were given. Let me first start by uh, addressing, if you don't mind, the issue of mandates. Um, you know, I, will, I am the administrator. I am responsible um, for ensuring that we work quickly to complete the mandates. Mm -hmm. I can attest to, um, you know, actions by previous administrators. I'm the administrator now. It's my responsibility. I understand that. But I think we've made good progress. Um, you know, the, the three rules that um, we have heard going back to a, uh, a railroads hazmat, a railroads pipeline and hazmat subcommittee meeting last June really made it clear from both sides of the aisle that we need to move these mandates. Uh, as I indicated in my comments, I went back to the staff and I said, we need to do, we need to do better than we're doing now. And I, I looked at the oil spill plan for railroads because that was close to being done and was a very, very important rule as well as the prohibition of lithium batteries and passenger aircraft, which was another great concern. But the pipeline bills uh, were equally important. Now, we finished our work on the uh, liquid uh, pipeline rule, and again, as I had mentioned, uh, that's been over at OMB now for about 50 days, and we're hoping to get response back fairly soon. Um, the two other rules that um, were of greatest concern, the gas transmission pipeline. We've, committed, we've completed our work there. It's been done for a while, and it's going through the internal review process at DOT. We have been very responsive to questions that are coming back from, from uh, the office of the secretary, so we're being as responsive as we can to respond. The one bill that I think um, seems to have obtained the most, and probably rightfully so, the most uh, focus is the rupture and automatic valve rule. And that wasn't in a final rule stage. That one was in a notice of proposed rulemaking. So that one agreeably has languished the most. Uh, our team has finished uh, the writing of that notice of proposed rulemaking. That, too, is also being reviewed by the Secretary's office. So all three of those, we really hope to see um, two final rules completed and a notice of proposed rulemaking moving forward. We have several other mandates behind that that we're working equally hard on. To address the question about staffing, um, we have 581 employees at PHMSA, about 310 are, are assigned to the pipeline side. Uh, I've mentioned before, um, it's tough for us to compete with industry to hire good, qualified, as you said, pipeline engineers. And I, interesting, I was in Atlanta yesterday and my director of human resources was over at Virginia Tech trying to figure out how we can create a better a recruiting bed at colleges and universities that put out good engineers. I think part of the problem is we need to make people more aware of the important safety mission of PHMSA because I think once they understand that, we're going to be more attractive to, uh, to, to um, be in a place to hire. But right now, we've done a great job in filling the gaps, the voids that we had in our hiring, and it's given me a better position to see how effective are we with the current staff. I especially appreciate your comments about emergency responders. 
Uh, in my 40 years in the railroad, I was responsible for uh, emergency response. And during that time, I lived in New Jersey and was actually the part-time emergency management coordinator for the town that I lived in in South Jersey. So I fully appreciate the fact that we need to do more to help emergency responders. And you're absolutely correct. It is a responsibility of the oil and gas industry to make sure that they work with emergency responders, especially on drills and exercises. I want to thank you, and I uh, want to just remind you that we'll be submitting additional questions for the record. Uh, now, on the chair, now I recognize uh, Mr. Upton for five minutes uh, for the purposes of asking questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to appreciate uh, the testimony that uh, you all provided us today. I know that we have a, a good number of, of questions, and I particularly want to thank Mr. Elliott, the administrator, for his uh, personal review of uh, the nation's pipelines. Uh, I know you've been to Michigan a number of times. Uh, you've met with Republicans and Democrats as we all care about the, uh, these issues. And I just really appreciate your hands-on experience and your, your willingness to, to come and, and help us here. Uh, it's been clear for a long time that pipelines are really the safest way to transport oil and gas as it relates to incidents. But of course, as you said in your testimony, it just takes one bad, bad issue to, to really blow up and, and, and uh, make a, a mess, big mess of, of things in, in, a, in a major way. And uh, as you heard in my opening statement, yes, we are disappointed that TSA is not here. And I, I guess some could suggest that TSA has uh, really increased uh, by sixfold their, their uh, inspectors uh, because it's gone from one what I thought was six, but I'm now told that it's now less than a handful, it's actually four. Is that correct? That is correct. <laughs> so here I was giving them the benefit of a doubt, it's a handful plus one, but it's actually less than a handful of folks around the country, which I don't think is a very good trend. This committee has worked a long time on cyber protections. God help us if somebody gets into one of these systems and does something bad that, that that would really uh, pose a problem. Uh, we're all aware of public events, the FBI and others have, have, have talked about, uh, but I guess I wanna refer this to Mr. Russell as the GAO. Uh, in your report, what type of emphasis uh, has TSA, knowing that they have these massive resources uh, uh, to look at, at the, the potential for a cyber attack uh, on any of our pipelines, and, and what have they done to address that, knowing that, in fact, there are published incidents of uh, collusion, let me put it that way, state-sponsored? That's correct. So as DNI Coates recently acknowledged in the, the last intelligence assessment, you have nation states with the full capability to, to do harm to our uh, pipeline network. Um, and as you mentioned, with TSA's resources, uh, it was six when we concluded our report in December. So if it's down to four, that's, as you mentioned, less than a handful. And one of the concerns that we found in our review was uh, the pipeline security officials did not necessarily have the requisite expertise and skills when it came to cybersecurity. And that's one of the things that we recommended that TSA try to uh, account for when it does its workforce plan as part of a, one of our recommendations. On page six of the GAO report, it says, and I'll quote this to you, our analysis of T TSA's data found that at least 34 of the top 100 critical pipeline systems TSA deemed highest risk indicated that they had no critical facilities. Can you go a little, dive a little deeper into that? What, what, what are they missing? What, what, where, sh where should they be? Sure, so the, the way it works now is it's a voluntary process. So the pipeline operators- Should it be mandatory? Well, if they follow, one of the first steps, I think, and where we went with the recommendation was for TSA to clarify their, their guidelines first to make it more clear what is the definition of a critical facility. And that's what we found is that there was some confusion around that such that a full third of the top 100 most critical pi pipeline operators had not identified any critical facilities, which then affects um, which reviews that you do. I mean, what, what wouldn't, I'm sorry to interrupt, yep. what wouldn't be critical? I mean, we had this 
Kalamazoo Embridge <laughs> line that went Kalamazoo River. It was a billion dollars for Embridge to clean that up. Mm -hmm. They didn't report it for what turned out to be a couple of days. Uh, and it was, you know, pretty major. I'm Michigan, so, you know, crosses your hand here. Right. But a billion dollars, uh, just, you know, a small, I mean, what's not critical that they, they would look at? Well, these are self-reported, so it's up to each of the pipeline operators to self-identify what's a critical facility. And that brings it around, I think, to one of the other points in the opening statement around the recommendation follow-up. So as TSA does their corporate security reviews, they may ask questions of the pipeline operators. Hey, it, it looks like you may have a critical facility here. That may even be a recommendation. But if they don't go back to follow up to see if it's implemented, then you're continuing to uh, have that risk. Knowing that my time has expired, let me just make a quick comment, not a question. That is, for that particular pipeline, good news, it was completely replaced. Replaced at the new standards that this committee uh, pushed through. I want to say it was about four and a half million dollars per mile uh, as across the state, mm -hmm. uh, but, but we took care of it uh, the, the right way. Thank you very much for your testimony. Sure. I yield back. And the chair now recognizes Mr. Prentice from the Green State of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing today. Um, I uh, had a couple questions maybe to follow up on the issue of uh, resource constraints. Um, um, I've heard requests over the years for the increased use of technology to expedite gas pipeline inspections and safety monitoring. Um, it might be a little bit of a double-edged sword, but with respect to um, cyber, but I'll get to that with Mr. Russell. But Mr. Elliott, um, are there technologies you think need to be incorporated so that industry and regulators can better evaluate pipeline safety, particularly given the resource constraints we see at TSA? Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, the short answer is yes. If I can elaborate, um, I will tell you that in, in my year and a half as the administrator of PHMSA, but backed by many years in the rail industry where we saw technology move in leaps and bounds, I've seen the same thing in the use of technology uh, to help uh, quickly expand the capabilities of inline pipeline inspection technology. Um, one concern that I have with that is, uh, even as good as it is, it's still not perfect. Uh, and uh, much of the inline inspection tools that are in place today, and again, the level of sophistication is amazing, really focus on, on three purposes. One is to extend the usable life of the infrastructure. The second actually is to help reduce the amount of actual physical inspections that have to be done, thereby reducing costs. And the third is an absolute tangible improvement in safety. Uh, at PHMSA, we focus on trying to encourage the research and development, both with the dollars that we have that go into R&D and what we encourage industry to do, to really focus first and foremost on the absolute safety value there. One of the criticisms we get is, our, is PHMSA's inability to move quickly to get out of the way of industry to implement this new safety technology. And I would agree with that. I think our special permitting process is a bit slow, and part of the language that we're trying to look at in reauthorization will help speed that up. Um, but I do think that technology will continue to expand at a rapid pace uh, and will continue to improve pipeline safety. And you think that that's something that's being taken care of by industry, or do you think that Congress needs to take action? In that? Um, Congressman, I do believe that's something that industry is, is taking care of themselves because it benefits the ability to, as I mentioned, to extend the life of the infrastructure and help reduce inspection costs. I will tell you that at, at PHMSA, we spend our R&D dollars more on what we consider to be step change R&D, maybe not the safe R&D. For example, one of the, uh, the R&D efforts that recently has been successful in dollars that we put in is to, the ability to locate plastic pipe. Distribution lines are going more to plastic pipes. You can't use the same technology to locate the pipes. So we'd like to see more industry dollars go to some of that uh, more step change safety that's not really being focused on as much. I didn't hear you mention explicitly mention leak detection as one of the purposes, the objects of um, the technology, but I assume that would be covered as well. Yeah, I, I do think, uh, and again, in, in my time, uh, I've been relatively impressed, at least in the, the leak detection capabilities that exist in control rooms. But probably more to your point, 
Um, there's more that I think that can be done to identify smaller, some of those imperceptible leaks which, which tend to plague the industry. I think uh, the larger releases, the, the systems seem to do a very good job. Uh, but you're probably correct, both with the inline inspection capabilities that might identify uh, issues before they ever turn into a leak. Uh, all of that, I think, with time will continue to reduce the likelihood of both large-scale leaks and small leaks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell, um, in terms of lethality and cost of recovery, are pipelines in America more at risk from a cyber attack or a physical attack? I think there are, there are definitely physical security concerns, as we've seen with um, environmental groups and others that have that caused damage. But the, the cyber threat is one that is ever emerging and ever evolving. And I think that's one where um, we thought there's more that could be done. Let me ask you this, because um, mm -hmm. I have about a minute left. Um, as industry continues to deploy technology, um, what should how, how should the government make sure that from a cyber perspective, that our citizens are protected. Because, you know, I mean, technology is the point at which, um, you know, where bad actors t tend to try to, to make those, uh, those uh, inroads. What, what do you think is the role for the, the government, either uh, administrative or the Congress, to make sure that we protect our citizens from a cyber attack? Sure, I think it boils down to robust oversight. So um, do pipeline operators understand what their operating systems are, their control systems, right. SCADA systems, the industrial control systems, that would be the point of attack. And have you adequately protected those? Anything that government can do to put out uh, a framework? So for okay. example, the- I'm gonna, I'm, I got four seconds left, so I, I appreciate the answer. I would say, um, let's continue to work on that together. Thank you for showing up. And when you say oversight and we have the TSA not showing up, uh, you, obviously that frustrates the purpose of uh, uh, the ability of us to do oversight. So uh, I just note that for the record as well, and I yield back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lana, for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks very much for holding today's hearing. It's very, very important uh, that we have this hearing, and I want to thank our panelists for being with us today. And also like to uh, again welcome uh, Commission, Commissioner Friedman for being with us today. Uh, comes from Northwest Ohio, not too far from where I'm from, and so we appreciate you being here, making the effort. If I could uh, start my question with you, if I may, Mr. Friedman, or Commissioner Friedman, as you mentioned in your testimony, Ohio is only one of eight states that acts as a interstate agent for FEMSA, which comes with considerable additional responsibility. We inform the subcommittee about Ohio's working relationship with FEMSA. Yes, thank you for the question, Representative Latta. Uh, I, I, I think if you were to ask the commission staff anecdotally, they would characterize the relationship as professional, mutually respectful, cooperative, as well as productive. I mean, there's, there's an acknowledgement of a shared accountability, I believe, in terms of the interstate pipeline and the assumption of responsibilities associated with the inspection. Uh, it enables the commission staff, frankly, to uh, uh, leverage the, the, the sense of funding in a way, again, to, to train, retrain, and retain good qualified individuals which then serve to benefit Ohio and uh, exemplary uh, in terms of the, the compelling need to address these same situations nationally. Uh, so it's a, it's a very positive relationship. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, Administrator Elliott. What could Congress do to help uh, drive innovation and foster an environment where operators can incorporate new technologies and best practices? Well, Congressman, thank you for the, uh, the, the question. Um, I think perhaps the best way is just uh, continued support and perhaps even uh, a greater thirst for understanding um, how the oil and gas pipeline industry uh, apply technology and innovation. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a fairly constant drumbeat for us at FIMSA to encourage the, the, the pace at which that gets put into place. Um, but I do believe that the more that people understand uh, what is in place and what more can be done, uh, there might be some additional encouragements that can be brought to bear. 
Let me follow up uh, with more data and information demonstrating the capabilities of new technologies operating in real world, real, real world situations be helpful to FEMSA as it pursues updates to inspection and maintenance repair critical uh, in these regulations? Yes, I think we have a, a large thirst for uh, good, reliable data. Um, we, we maintain a lot of that already, but I think, Congressman, the only way we're going to continue to get better is to continue to seek information data that's going to allow us uh, to continue to improve our safety mission. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Friedman, uh, I understand that Ohio has a good accelerated pipeline replacement program. Uh, would you talk a little bit about uh, the Commission's role to ensure that pipeline rates are a adequate to allow for pipeline replacement and modernization? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks again for the question. The Commission needs to remain cognizant of the fact that the costs associated with the capital investment uh, concomitant to the, to the implementation of the program are essentially allocated socially across rate base. So as I alluded to in my, in my opening statement, uh, there's a means by which we not only, the Commission, not only incentivized accelerated replacement but accelerated recovery. Now associated with that re accelerated recovery is an annual audit where the Commission could revisit the expenses and the prudence and, and, and the various criteria by which we can uh, appropriately balance the cost associated with the investment against the benefits derived from the investment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell, if I could uh, go to your testimony and uh, you, when you found that you said uh, on page five, we found that TSA's pipeline security branch had uh, issued revised pipeline security guidelines back in March of 2018, but TSA had not established a documented process to ensure that revisions occur and fully capture updates to supporting standards. But kind of, you go down, but you get right into the reflect the dynamic threat and uh, that environment and to incorporate cybersecurity principles. I'm concerned because in, in this subcommittee, in this full committee, we hear a lot about the attacks that occur out there. And how much of a, you know, a, you know, is TSA taking these threats on the cyber attacks that uh, are occurring uh, on the pipelines out there to make sure that these guidelines get in place? Right, so they were able to update them in March 2018, as you mentioned, and part of that update was to include more guidance for the pipeline operators on cybersecurity issues. Um, I, why we think it's very timely needed for them to have a process to continue to update that is about a month after uh, the guidelines came out, there was a new set of uh, an updated framework from NIST that included some additional provisions around uh, supply chain risks and some other things that um, are important to also incorporate. And so our concern is that we want TSA to have a process so you don't wait another six or seven years to then incorporate those standards into the security guidelines. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Now you yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, we're beginning the process of developing legislation to reauthorize the Pipeline Safety Act. And first, we have to understand the current state of affairs and what work remains incomplete from previous reauthorizations. But unfortunately, as I noted in my opening statement, numerous congressional mandates from the 2011 and 2016 reauthorizations have not been finalized by PHMSA. So I wanted to start with Administrator Elliott. I'd like to ask you for updates on some of these outstanding mandates. First, what is the status of the rulemaking on emergency order authority that was included in the 2016 uh, Pipes Act? So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. And um, as you may recall, the, we submitted an interim final rule for the emergency order authority, which we believe gives us the uh, an intended authority that Congress was looking for. We have since, uh, after further public review and comment, have uh, made some modifications to that, specifically about the timelines that uh, industry may have to do an appeal to that process. We've completed our final uh, rule language, and it is currently over at OMB. Okay. Now, what's the status of the rulemaking mandated in the 2011 Act to expand integrity management beyond high-consequence areas? 
Right. Well, and really that falls into two rules that um, we are working on. The liquid safety rule, which I had mentioned in my comment, there are some integrity management aspects there. We've finished our work there, uh, and that also is at OMB. The other component is in the gas transmission rule. Uh, when I first came to FIMS about a year and a half ago, um, that gas transmission rule was affectionately referred to as the mega rule. It had gotten so big, I don't know how it could have ever Move. So we split it into three parts, the mandate section, another section of the bill that deals with integrity management, some damage prevention, and the third part is gathering lines. We've completed our work on the mandate section and we're actively working on the second section of that that deals with some additional integrity management work. And then lastly, what's the status of the um, rulemaking mandated in, in the 2016 Act to regulate underground? natural gas storage facilities. Right. We've, uh, we've completed our work with that, and that is also being reviewed by uh, the Office of the Secretary. Yeah, I know, I know, Mr. Elliott, that you inherited many of these delayed mandates, but the fact remains that your agency is behind schedule, obviously, so we hope we'll begin to see major progress this year. And I wanted to shift briefly to Bill Russell from GAO. Your December 2018 report highlighted troubling weaknesses in the Transportation Security Administration's pipeline security program. And in your report, you found that the TSA pipeline security branch had not calculated relative risk among the top 100 critical pipeline systems using its risk ranking tool since 2014, and that the risk ranking tool did not include current data. So my question is, can you please elaborate on these findings and how GAO's recommendations address the shortfalls you identified in TSA's risk ranking tool? Right, so the risk ranking tool is, is critical because that really shapes which uh, companies, which pipeline operators TSA is going to review with the limited resources that they have. So what we saw is some shortcomings in how they thought about the threats that were encountered, obviously, from 2014 to now, there have been evolving threats. One of the questions we had was the extent to which some of the cybersecurity issues had been factored in uh, to that initial risk assessment. Um, another one had to do with just the safety of the pipeline system. So for example, a pipeline network may be more vulnerable if, for example, FEMSA has identified some age and safety issues. Was that factored into the risk ranking uh, in order to prioritize uh, reviews. So we had uh, four different recommendations to try to get at some of these issues. I mean, you know, I'm very concerned, obviously, as many of us are here, that TSA is working with outdated information, which can have dire consequences for a program focused on the security of the country's pipeline network. And again, it's unacceptable that TSA refused to testify at this hearing or explain how it's responding and reacting to the troubling finding in GAO's report, but I, I certainly appreciate what GAO is doing and you know your ongoing efforts to do oversight of this. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. McKinley, uh, my friend from West Virginia, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, go back to the title of this hearing says it's the state of pipeline safety and security in America. The state of pipeline safety and security in America. So I'm, I'm just curious with, if we look back, uh, I've got a chart here that says that in the last 10 years, we're now transporting nearly 40% more material through our pipelines, gas and fuel oil and whatever, uh, over 40% increase on that. Also, I've seen that since 1999 to today, uh, or last year, it doesn't, the number of incidents have not varied much. I guess, it's, back to your an earlier comment, someone said, if there's just one, it's a problem. And I, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But I think the reality is when you're transporting 614 million cubic feet of material, there, there, there's a chance, just like in an airplane with 737 MAX and, and others, there's, there's gonna be a chance of something going wrong. But, but over nearly 20 years, 
we virtually had no increase in, in incidents. We were 275. We've dropped to 233, 258, 264, 278, uh, 303, and we're 286 last year. So it's essentially the same. And we're, and we're transporting a tremendously increase in product. So I, I'm, I'm curious on this is, would you, how would you grade, Mr. Elliott, how would you grade your performance? Is it the fact that there are any, this is a, a, a C or a D or, or how would you give it a grade in overall the safety and the security of America with our pipeline system? Well, Congressman, thank you for that very important question. Uh, before I assign a grade, I will tell you, we can never, ever do enough. I mean, we will constantly strive every day, at least while I'm in the administrator's chair, to improve the safety, not only of pipeline safety. A lot of people forget we also have the responsibility of surface transportation safety, which is 1.2 million shipments of hazardous materials a day, in addition to the 2.7 million miles of pipeline that we have. But if I were to give a C or give a grade, I would give us a C because I think we're doing well, but we're never doing good enough. I think um, some of the comments that we had earlier, I do think that we will see continue to see great advancements in safety through technology, innovation, research and development. But from my perspective, I think it's going to be constantly working with the highly professional team at PHMSA to make sure that each and every day that we're out working with operators and members of the public to make uh, the okay. transportation of energy products by pipeline as per as Thank practical you. and safe as possible. Mr. Rosa, how would you grade it? How would you, given, because you're something, you've got an outside view of it. Right. How do you, given the increased traffic, no increase, virtually no increase in number of incidents, but there are incidents in that, in every one. As I said before, I don't like that either. But what, what, how would you grade it? I think overall, based on our most recent report, it's clearly a needs improvement, um, whether it's, taking care of some elements in the pipeline security guidelines that the pipeline operators rely on uh, to help manage their processes, um, being a little bit more diligent on just following up on the common sense recommendations that the pipeline security folks at TSA make to those operators. Well, if I, if I could, let me, let me sure. follow up with that a little bit mm -hmm. because I, I interpret what you're saying is uh, maybe more regulations, so I'm, I'm curious because I've got the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've heard about that. Um, there are 67 permits that had to be granted. 67 for FERC, the FAA, the Federal Communication Director, the NOAA, uh, the National Park Service, the, the Corps of Engineers in Huntington, Pittsburgh, Norfolk, Wilmington. Uh, I could go on and on. 67 different permits to be able to do you think the increased regulations, I'm not talking about doing away with any of them, but increasing the number of regulations, is that going to give us more safety and security of our pipeline? Well, I'll say for the TSA role, it's, it's our, there, there isn't a, a regulation. It's, it's a voluntary-based system. So I think our point is just making sure that that process works as effectively as possible in the absence of a regulation. I'll think about that a little bit, but thank you, I yield back. Sure. The chair now recognizes Mr. Doyle for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, this conversation is particularly important to my district uh, of Pittsburgh. Uh, Pennsylvania's energy mix has rapidly transformed in recent years due to the Marcellus Shale and as a result of the natural gas boom, Pennsylvania is experiencing uh, a build out of infrastructure from pipelines to the Shell Cracker plant in Beaver County, just outside my district. Uh, this can be a great resource, but only if we ensure that the pipelines meet stringent safety and environmental standards so that we're protecting the health and safety of the people of Pittsburgh as well as the country. Um, Mr. Elliott, Carnegie Mellon University in my district uh, is a world-class center for robotics, which can play a vital role for monitoring the safety and security of pipelines and protecting the environment. Uh, how does PHMSA take into account new and emerging technology 
and how do you ensure the performance standards reflect the most effective technology available? Well, Congressman, thank you, uh, and I appreciated visiting the gas transmission uh, um, work going on in, in your district last week. Um, uh, you know, as I, I mentioned, uh, PHMSA has and, and uh, provides R&D dollars to um, help ensure that we're, we're staying current with the most cutting edge. One of the ways that we do that is, is on a biannual basis, and we're actually thinking now to do it more often, we hold an R&D forum where we allow um, uh, univ colleges and universities and others that are involved in pipeline research and development to come in and we kind of spell out what we're looking for, where we see, where we think we need to see research and development progress in the pipeline, especially the pipeline safety area. And then uh, from that forum, we receive applications for uh, R&D, some of it actually including robotics that you mentioned about. And then based on the best applications, we will provide the, the, the funds that we have to pursue that R&D. I wish we could do more, but we do the best we can. Let me ask you, um, several pipelines are under construction in Pennsylvania right now. Late last year, it was reported that Energy Transfer in Sunoco had amassed more than 800 state and federal permit violations while building two pipelines, the Rover and Mariner East II across Pennsylvania and Ohio. I've heard concerns that the two pipelines, despite being under construction, have polluted waterways with gallons of drilling fluid and created sinkholes in backyards. Uh, can you please describe some of these violations? Well, um, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. And we, we continue to work very closely with um, our state partners in Pennsylvania that have been doing most of the oversight there. Um, and, and I will tell you, yes, I think we have at PHMSA a concern based on our dialogue with the, uh, uh, the state pipeline office about perhaps uh, a lack of professional construction um, methods that are being used. Uh, so I think we wholly support the actions that are being taken by uh, at the state level to enforce uh, perhaps a, a more rigid construction standard. Uh, you know, in the work that I did for many years uh, in the railroad industry, and, and Pennsylvania was one of the big states we'd, we, we worked in, I also oversaw all the environmental aspects of the railroad. And I will tell you that I have a great concern any time there's any, any kind of impact to the environment, whether or not it's a hazardous substance or whether or not it's, it's material that basically is, is a byproduct of directional boring, which was some of the case where we had right. here. Uh, so I agree with the aggressiveness that the, the state uh, oversight is providing here. Um, studies have shown since 2010 at least two critical detection systems designed to help operators avoid costly accident only were detecting uh, right-of-way spills roughly 12 percent of the time. In fact, random observations from the public were nearly four times more effective uh, in detecting leaks. Um, given that PHMSA studies have shown that industry leak detection can be unreliable, what is PHMSA doing to incorporate modern leak detection standards into its rulemaking, and when can we expect action on that? Well, Congressman, again, thank you for the question, and, and we have incorporated some additional uh, leak detection uh, language within both our liquid and uh, gas rulemakings, but I will also say that um, it is our intent uh, I think to continue to see progression in the technology and uh, the actions by the operators that will identify the potential for any kind of small leak. The, the larger leaks, um, typically the ones that the industry will quickly uh, identify through their control rooms, it's those small leaks that propagate and may go unnoticed for many days. I think that is where technology is going to be most useful to find areas of likely uh, release and get in and correct that long before it can ever harm the environment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman for, for yielding back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffin, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to pick up with uh, Mr. Doyle's questions, but first, I want to thank you for mentioning uh, Virginia Tech, which is in my district, and I hope that uh, you all were successful in finding some uh, folks there who are willing to work for you, a lot of good people. So I know that uh, it was a worthwhile trip. 
Uh, you know, Mr. Doyle was already picking up on it, and there are a lot of new technologies coming out. Uh, one that I've I've looked at uh, that I think has some real potential: fiber optic. Uh, you know, placing that out there to track leaks. Um, we have a couple of pipelines coming through Virginia, one of which comes through my district and comes very close to Virginia Tech. And a lot of people are concerned about the safety and, you know, the small leaks, as you said, are, are where the new technologies can go. But what is PHMSA doing to remove any regulatory barriers? And, and let me know if you think there are some and incentivize the adoption of new technologies because we've got this big gas pipeline coming through. And it appears to me that FERC is not requiring that they use some of these new technologies to make sure that, that these facilities are you know, completely safe. And even if it's just a small gas leak, what's small today, as you know, can be big tomorrow and can cause a problem not only to the environment, but, but to the people who live near that pipeline. Congressman, thank you for the question. And um, um, I think one of the items that I have uh, been most impressed with is we've seen advancements in, in technology uh, and I do believe that as we see new construction and complete replacement of pipelines, uh, I do think that you're going to see, uh, and some is available today and, and some will continue to be available, that uh, you know, the, the pipeline installation process will include systems that will self-report the health of the pipeline above and beyond what happens today with inline inspection technology. So I think the combination of several things, continued use of integrity management systems by um, the operators, the continued uh, expansion of technology and inline inspection technology, and then the continued use of self-diagnostic uh, capabilities with new and totally replaced pipeline. I do think that in the not too distant future, we will probably see a new constructed pipeline that will, will be able to self-report on a regular basis. It's, it's, it's real-time health. So, so here's my concern and the concern my constituents have, and I know they were trying to sell a product, but some folks came in with their fiber optics and they were able to show how they can detect based on the temperature change. If you just lay that fiber optic on top of the pipeline, you can tell if there's a small leak. You can also tell if somebody's trying to do physical harm to the pipeline for whatever reasons, because they can, in real time, can see if somebody's driving up or walking up to the pipeline. If somebody starts digging near the pipeline, they can see all of that. And yet the pipe is not in the ground yet. The technology appears to be ready. And FERC doesn't seem to be requiring it. Do you all work with FERC to say, hey, this is new technology. It's not that expensive. And when you're talking about a pipeline that's going to be in the ground for decades and, and near a lot of communities, I think people would sleep a lot better in my district if they knew that that was, that was there. And it's not, there's no plan for it. Pipe's not in the ground yet uh, in a large part of my district. What can we do to encourage the operators to do that? And what can you all do to work with FERC to say, hey, this is something that really ought to be, be done? Well, we'll continue to, to have dialogue, dialogue with FERC on a regular basis, and, and we will discuss that. But I think uh, one of the other things that we can do, and, and the regular dialogue that we have with the oil and gas operators, is to continue to push the uh, use of new technologies that will um, uh, minimize uh, leaks and releases of pipelines. We can have that conversation with them. Well, I certainly hope that you will. And there are some new people on FERC, uh, so I don't want to say that they're all like this, but, but I, I will tell you, at one point a few years back, we had three congressmen from our region who asked for additional hearings, and we got nothing. And that's very discouraging. It doesn't seem like they're very open to input. I hope you have a different experience. That being said, I've got a few more seconds. What's your favorite new technology on pipeline safety? You've got to have one that you're just like, hey, that's pretty neat. Um, to me, I actually think it's the ability to locate non-metallic pipeline that uh, is becoming so prevalent in um, uh, natural gas distribution systems in major metropolitan areas because I think that has the greatest uh, opportunity to create safety. I know in the incident that occurred in Durham, North Carolina, where a directional boring machine tapped into a distribution line, um, I just think that the ability to be able to more accurately identify non-metallic pipeline is probably my favorite. I appreciate that. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney from California for five minutes. Well, thank the chairman for that. 
and I thank the uh, witnesses this morning. Um, Administrator Elliott, on September 9th of 2010, I was on the San Mateo Bridge when the San, Mat when the San Bruno explosion occurred. Um, two of my three children live in the peninsula just south uh, of San Francisco. Um, also, the Aliso Canyon uh, leak, which was incredibly dangerous, and we were very lucky that there were no explosions with that, occurred in California. Near my district, we have three large natural gas storage facilities, including the McDonnell Island, which is 82 billion cubic feet. So are the inspections by the California Public Utility Commission and the federal authorities for these facilities and the high pressure transmission pipelines doing enough to keep our community safe? Are they doing enough? Uh, Congressman, I, I, I do believe that um, the work being performed is, is adequate. And I first want to say, you know, I, um, when I first came to PHMSA, it was, you know, the discussion of San Bruno and the eight fatalities that occurred there and that Aliso Canyon was the worst natural gas release we've ever had in this country. So those resonate very much. You know, we are so dependent upon uh, the use of our state partners to oversee uh, certain operations, and 80% of uh, the pipeline system in the U.S. today falls to the oversight of, of our state partners. Um, I think, as I said earlier, there's always more we can do. We always need to strive to get better. We, we need to work more close, closely with, with our state partners to make sure that um, we are being uh, as forward-thinking as possible. Uh, but I would have to say that at this point in time, I do think the work is adequate. <clears throat> Well, we clearly have our complaints about the pace of the FEMSA's rulemaking, but are we being too demanding about the safety of our constituents? Is that part of the problem? No, I mean, you can never, uh, never not take into uh, account the absolute importance of the safety of your constituents. And uh, as I had mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have every reason to continue to focus on improving and completing those mandates so the safety value of those rules can get out and be in place. Well, what's, what's the holdup in these rulemakings? I mean, is industry dragging its feet or right. you don't have enough personnel? Do you need more resources from Congress? I mean, what's the holdup here? Yeah. And as I had mentioned before, I, 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 I understand it is my responsibility as the administrator today to complete these mandates going back to 2011 and 2016, and we work on that every day. Uh, for most of the mandates that uh, uh, have been brought to our attention as being most important, the liquid, the gas, the rupture detection valve rule, we've completed our work on those, and they're going through the necessary review before they can be published as a final rule, except for the rupture and, and uh, automatic valve rule, which is a notice of proposed rulemaking. So we've got, granted, we've got a ways to go on that, but it has got a greatest attention at FEMSA, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell, uh, I've introduced some grid cybersecurity bills in Congress and a number of other uh, in previous Congresses. Your example of the TSA's criteria for determining pipeline a facility criticality is a potential for mass casualties or significant health effects. It's very concerning that the pipeline operators interpret this differently. What more can the TSA do to provide more clarity to operators of whether the facilities qualify and the additional steps that are necessary to make the infrastructure more secure? Thank you for the question. Now, so certainly, TSA did update uh, the guidelines in 2018, so that's, that's a good thing to make them more current. But it's really some of those key terms. What does mass casualty mean? How does that uh, translate to the area you're operating in? Um, again, the issues around the, the criticality, what exactly does that mean? So I think either a glossary or more specificity around some of those key terms is what we're uh, proposing that TSA try to, to do. Good, thank you. Commissioner Friedman, how do you deal with FEMSA's shortage of personnel? Um, is that, is that a, a factor affecting your capability to do your job? Not that I have been informed from our, from our staff, uh, recognizing, however, that uh, there is an assessment on uh, basically a, an operator's proportion, pro, proportionate throughput. 
uh, that offsets any shortfall relative to funding. So, so there is a budgetary opportunity on the part of the commission to address some of the some of the issues inferentially that you're talking about. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, Chair thanks, and gentlemen. Chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson of Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Friedman, welcome today from the great state of Ohio. Um, we may have covered some of this ground already, but I want to dig in a little deeper. I really appreciate you being here uh, to discuss how uh, the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio best keeps our pipeline systems functioning and safe. Uh, Ohio Safety Program has received the maximum score available, as you know, on FISMA's audits over the last two years, which I think demonstrates how seriously uh, PUCO uh, takes pipeline safety. now. I appreciated that in your testimony, you reiterated PUCO's mission statement, which focuses on reliability and safety, but also affordability. And I'm sure each of these issues were taken into consideration when Ohio developed its accelerated pipeline replacement program. So I know uh, Congressman Lotta got into this a little bit, but can you talk a little bit deeper about uh, the program's importance and your commission, this ex, uh, replacement program, and your commission's role to ensure that pipeline rates are adequate and just to allow for pipeline replacement and modernization? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the comments uh, relative to the PUCO. Uh, as I had indicated previously, uh, the costs associated with the investments are obviously socialized across ratepayers. Uh, so there, there is a need to balance, once again, to, to attempt to achieve the equilibrium between benefit and cost. And, and that is really uh, something that is, I think, inherent in the nature of the recovery mechanism that we use relative to using a rider rather than waiting for, an, for, a, for a rate case. So that enables the Commission to review on an annual basis. What are some of the balancing factors? I mean, when you talk about your philosophy of balancing quality and safety with, uh, with cost um, and uh, um, uh, acceleration, what are some of the factors that you, that you use to balance all of that out? Well, uh, you, obviously one of, the, uh, one of the key considerations is bill impact. Uh, recognizing again that, that you know affordability is a function uh, uh, affordability is not a constant across all, all, all ratepayers. Uh, that that is from the highest perspective a consideration relative to to uh, the social cost associated. Uh, in terms of the implementation of the program itself, uh, there's a recognition that bare steel cast iron non-cathodically protected infrastructure uh, is subject to deterioration over time. Uh, so basically the staff, uh, in conjunction with, in cooperation with the utilities in the state, identified pipelines uh, that fall within the bucket targeted for replacement. And, and it was a very methodical approach that, that was started over a decade ago, and I believe that the uh, uh, Various utilities are at various stages of completion, uh, but that all four of the major uh, investor-owned utilities are intending to complete their uh, uh, programs by 2033. And to the credit of, of, of other utilities, non, uh, not those of the big four, they're beginning to adopt the same uh, uh, process, or ex at least express an interest in doing so recognizing, I think, the benefits to be derived. Okay. All right. Well, well thank you. Uh, Administrator Elliott, as you know, FISMA's state partners oversee more than 80 percent of the nation's pipeline infrastructure, especially the gas distribution pipelines that connect our homes and businesses uh, to the main transmission system. Can you talk a little bit about state programs and the methodology that FISMA uses to distribute state pipeline safety grants? And Congressman, thank you for the question. There are um, all every there are, there are all but two states that participate in the state program uh, with FEMSA. Alaska and Hawaii are the two. Um, uh, so on a on an annual basis, FEMSA will uh, work with the state to receive information about their current inspection program, 
uh, about uh, the goals that they've achieved, about the staffing that they have. Um, we take that information and then we will conduct uh, a re review of the state program looking very much at the same information, the adequacy of the program. Uh, is staff adequately trained? Are they meeting their goals? Uh, and then with the dollars that are allocated to FIMSA as, as part of our state-based grant, we look at the dollars that um, the state has projected that they have for the state program. Um, then we add those dollars and then factor in the score, and that ultimately uh, provides the funding to the state. Um, <clears throat> it's been mentioned before that while FIMSA can fund up to 80 percent, uh, over the last few years, it's hovered more closely to about 70 percent. And actually, one of the things that we've done, we recognize the importance of funding the state programs. Um, you know, we, we attention, occasionally we'll get a question about, well, what do you do for poor performing states? And one of the answers is, you know, we can reduce the amount of funding. But to me, that's counterproductive. Why would you reduce the amount of funding? So we try to keep the funding as robust as possible. But in the last few years, we've actually taken some unused funds at FIMSA and moved it over to the state-based program and to put in as much dollars as we can for the program. Okay. Well, well, thank you, and I apologize for going over, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the indulgence. I yield back. Chair, sure, now recognizes uh, Ms. Custer uh, from New Hampshire for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of you for being with us today. Um, I want to dive right into um, an accident was very close to home uh, in the neighboring community. September 2018, an accidental release of high-pressure gas caused an explosion just across the border from my district in Lawrence, Andover, and North Andover, Massachusetts, referred to as the Merrimack Valley incident. Over 130 structures were damaged as a result of the accident. More than 20 individuals were injured, and very sadly, one person lost their life. So what we've learned is that this tragic accident could have been completely avoided. And it's imperative, in my view, that Congress work to identify additional safety measures that can help prevent these types of accidents. So I want to address Mr. Elliott. My understanding is in 2011, the Pipeline Safety Regulatory Certainty and Job Creation Act required the use of automatic or remote controlled shutoff valves on transmission pipelines. But to date, PHMSA has not implemented this mandate despite the NTSB finding that the use of the automatic shutoff valves are effective in preventing and reducing the severity of pipeline explosions. So my question is, why has FEMSA not implemented this mandate over eight years since this bill was signed into law? Thank you for your question. Um, and we continue to um, feel for the Rondon family and the loss of their loved one in the uh, incident up in Massachusetts. Um, you're correct um, that um, the requirement for automatic shutoff on transmission lines is part of the rupture detection and uh, valve rule. Uh, in this case, we were dealing with a gas distribution line, and so the rules didn't necessarily apply there. But let me, um, uh, let me just expand what I think needs to be done or what we can do there. And, and I think it's important and to And is say, there any sense of urgency? Uh, Congressman, I think there's a significant sense of urgency. Um, I think this is a case, too, where um, the importance between FIMSA and the state partners actually works as intended. Um, this was, in, in every sense of the word, a monumental failure on the part of the operator. We set the minimum standards, federal standards, for pipeline safety. Um, states can and have for many years, and, and it's been over 50 years that states have been allowed to oversee their interstate process, but the states have the ability where if it's not in conflict with the, the minimum federal regulations to apply their own regulations to strengthen what the federal government has in place. And that's exactly what happened in Massachusetts. If you recall, the state legislature included specific language that now requires a professional engineer to sign off on the plan in the belief that having or doing that would have prevented this incident. The minimum federal uh, requirements are very clear. They require qualified individuals and a qualification process at every step of the process. So we believe that the federal standards, if, in, if had, they had been adhered to in the Merrimack Valley incident, would have prevented this. 
but this is a good case where the state felt they needed to go above and beyond the federal standards. Um, I, I think, to going back to your original question, I think there'll be a, a lot further discussion about uh, the importance of automatic shutoff valve, not just on transmission lines, but on gas distribution lines. So what's the holdup from instituting this requirement? Right. Well, as I had mentioned before, um, the, the rupture detection and automatic valve rule is probably one that has languished the longest at FEMSA. It's in a notice of proposed rulemaking stage. We've finished our work on it, uh, and I have committed that uh, we will move that not only into the notice of proposed rulemaking so we can get it out to get public comment, but then move it to the final rule as quickly as possible. It is still on schedule to become a final rule before the end of the year. Can I ask you, do you know what percentage of new pipeline infrastructure has automatic shutoff valves? Is um, this accepted technology now and it's being installed? I do not know specifically, but I can determine that, and I will, uh, as quickly as possible, get back to you with that information, but I don't have the specifics of that. And what's your sense of the timeline for when Congress can expect, the and the public, the American public, for the mandate for the automatic shutoff valve to be implemented? Well, again, that, that rule, even though it's in a notice of proposed rulemaking stage, we still uh, have it on the books to be completed uh, in this year. That may be a bit aggressive, but we're going to work as hard as we can at FEMSA to move that bill forward. Uh, I appreciate that, and I urge you uh, the urgency of now to protect our constituents. So thank you. I yield thank back. You, the chair, thanks the general lady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Mushan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you can see the, the bipartisan frustration with delays in action from federal agencies. This is no, not blaming anyone here, but um, this is kind of a frustration not only in this area, but across the board where congressional intent determined and passed into law sometimes decades before has not been carried out. And uh, it's a frustrating problem. And uh, it sounds like you're doing the best, Mr. Elliott, to at least at FEMSA to to resolve some of those frustrations. Um, I also want to say that, you know, just as, uh, as technology involves in our own personal lives, you know, no one would go out and buy a computer that with 20-year-old technology. We shouldn't be putting pipelines in the ground with 20-year-old technology. As Mr. Griffith pointed out, there's new technology, including fiber optics, that in my view, if we're putting new pipeline in the ground and technology exists, we should find a way to utilize that um, because we wouldn't buy a we wouldn't buy a computer for our ourselves with 20 year old technology. It makes no sense. This happens across the government. It's very frustrating. I understand that there are stakeholders and there are costs involved in new technology, but we need to be more nimble uh, in in this process, especially as it relates to something as critical as pipeline safety. So with those opening comments, Mr. Friedman, I have and I have a question. This has been addressed a little bit, but I understand over the last several years, states have implemented mechanisms to accelerate the replacement of pipelines. That's a, a positive thing. Uh, in, in, in your testimony, you explain how these campaigns have helped rapidly modernize Ohio's aging infrastructure with over 5,000 mile, miles of distribution main lines and more than 1 million uh, service lines being replaced since the inception of the program nearly a decade ago. How do you, at the state level, balance the need for these investments with ultimately the cost that's borne by the ratepayers? It's a difficult balance, I understand. Uh, yes, sir, it is a difficult balance. I think it's a qualitative, uh, as much as it is a quantitative assessment. Uh, as I indicated to uh, uh, yeah. previously, uh, there's, a, there's a sensitivity relative to affordability, an acknowledgement that affordability is not a constant across all rate payers. Um, and then it, it's very difficult, as you suggest, to, to assign uh, a quantitative value to that. Uh, it's a consideration, it's, it's a variable that goes into the decision-making process. Uh, I can't be more specific than that. I'm, I'm sorry, I hope that's responsible. No, that, that is, I mean, it's a difficult process as it is in southern Indiana, you know, in the state of Indiana, where we have the need for updating, um, we did, uh, updating pipelines and other infrastructure, and then, of course, people like me hear back from the consti our constituents about 
about that. And I think sometimes maybe we don't, uh, as a society, as an as a society, give as much information about the process to to everyone for that, so that people understand. I think most people understand if you have more safe and 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 updated pipelines that may necessitate in the short run or even in the long run higher higher rates to cover the the uh, the capital improvements that have been made I think sometimes the frustration that I hear is that that understanding of that is not projected as as well as it is as well as it could be maybe to the people to the ratepayers and I I'm sure you guys do a great job of trying doing your best to do that but I would encourage everyone to you know, to try to project that to the ratepayers because we hear, we hear about it. We also hear about unfunded mandates from the federal government, specifically EPA and a number of air, and other agencies that that are blamed for that. But many times, again, it's it's just a frustration. Uh, Mr. Russell and I have about a minute. As you know, risk-based decision making is the best way to approach complex problems like cybersecurity, especially when you're dealing with 2.7 million miles of pipelines. Uh, is it true that TSA has not attempted to understand the relative risk of safety of a safety incident among the nation's most critical pipelines? Would you say that that's true or not true? I think for their their older risk assessment, the one that was done in 2014, one of the observations was not factoring in maybe some of the FEMSA safety data that would get at the, the age of a system and how that might affect the system's vulnerability, and that's one of the things that we'd like to see them take on. Okay, great. And and then last thing I'll say is I'm still struggling to, me personally, to understand why the TSA is the agency of record on some of these things, and I suspect that's happened over time, but it, it, it it's, I think someone else mentioned that maybe we should revisit the jurisdictional issues related to pipeline safety as part of our reauthorization. I just want to throw that out there. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time expired. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. O'Halloran for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, and to all our witnesses before us uh, today for joining our conversation on how Congress can ensure the pipelines of today do not harm our citizens, our economy, and environment of tomorrow. I believe Congress has a duty to legislate. The agencies have a duty to carry out the laws and implement re regulations in the spirit of the statute. In this vein, Mr. Chairman, it is my hope that we as a committee can continue working in a bipartisan fashion as we have in the past to reauthorize the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration's Pipeline Safety Program. Uh, Administrator Elliott, uh, I, I thank you for appearing before our committee today to provide perspective regarding pipeline safety issues. However, given TSA's role overseeing their pipeline security program, and with the growing threat of cyber attacks facing our nation, I find it troubling that TSA neglected to send a representative to appear before us in this vein. Hiding from the GAO report's negative findings is not the way to do this. Uh, sooner or later, the TSA will have to let the American people know uh, why they have met, not met their duty. And uh, I, I just, uh, having been involved in public safety in the past, I, I just uh, can't imagine why this type of process is uh, not addressed in a, an appropriate way. Administrator Elliott, I appreciate the diligent behind the scenes consultation you described in your testimony before our agency's issues of rulemaking. However, since you became Administrator, with which specific new actions and processes have you put into place to ensure these rulemakings are done in a timely fashion? Well, Congressman, um, thank you for the question, and, and especially as it regards to security. I think uh, Ranking Member Upton said it best. At FEMSA, we understand you can't separate safety and security, and even though we have the safety function, uh, the, the, the professional men and women of FEMSA that are out doing the inspections also uh, and I think it's worth mentioning also are trying to, where they can identify security concerns and convey that back to the industry and our colleagues at TSA. Um, I, with regards to what we're doing to try and um, expedite the rulemaking process, um, besides focusing on the sheer importance of moving the mandates, 
uh, which we, we, I can guarantee you we focus on every day. Uh, but one of the things we've done that may have had or will have the best outcome is, uh, you know, FEMSA really is two modal administrations in one, and we've actually uh, just started to complete the work of basically uh, bringing all the rulemaking activities into one single entity within FEMSA, and that's going to allow us to be more, more agile, uh, more responsive to rulemakings both on the pipeline and the hazardous material surface transportation side. It basically gives us the same ability to bring new resources together to form a single entity that's going to allow us to do uh, work quicker uh, and more efficiently. And again, as we say, flex more depending on where the regulatory need is going to be. So that's probably the most important thing we've done other than focusing on mandates each and every day, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, Section 30, uh, Mr. L.A., of the 2011 Pipeline Safety Act requires uh, development of protocols to consult with uh, Indian tribes that have hazardous material pipelines within their jurisdiction, and we know many of them do. How would you describe uh, the uh, agency's protocols to work with tribes on a pipeline near a reservation boundary and with the spill response zone entirely within the reservation? <clears throat> Congressman, um, thank you for the question. Actually, I think it's good, and I'll explain why. Um, it was last year in 2018 that uh, one of the, the, the senior field members of the pipeline team actually uh, prepared a protocol that uh, sets out how we're going to communicate with tribal authorities before we go in to do inspections, typically with uh, oil and gas operators. Uh, that's kind of independent of what the operators do, but we feel that it's absolutely necessary, necessary to make sure that uh, we provide the communications and, more importantly, the respect to the tribal leadership about uh, the pipeline uh, that operate uh, underground within um, their territories. But I think, more importantly, to also create a stronger link between uh, the tribal leadership and the FIMSA representatives so they know who to call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Elliott. And uh, Mr. Chairman, as a citizen, uh, forget the fact that we're here in Congress, but uh, just as a citizen, it really perturbs me uh, that, that an agency of government uh, does not appear before uh, the Oversight Committee. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I, I think both sides of the uh, aisle and this entire committee shares your, your thoughts on that. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for being here. Um, Administrator Elliott, uh, thank you for being here, and, and thank you for wearing that maize and blue tie uh, with a buckeye at the other end of the table. Uh, we appreciate a Wolverine representation there. I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but I did, and after the 10 years football drought we've had, we'll take anything. Uh, uh, Mr. Elliott, as you know, one of the challenges uh, for states in colder climates like Michigan uh, it's is inspecting pipelines for potential cracks, leaks, um, and, and and not having to shut off uh, or disrupt gas flow, especially in winters like last winter with the polar vortex that we experienced. Um, that's why um, uh, I'm excited about the development of, of new technologies like robot, robotic smart pigs uh, for inline inspections that could be used to help make pipelines safer. Other developments in recent years included drones for mapping, detecting leaks, software solutions to help analyze pipeline, and as uh, Mr. Griffith mentioned, fiber optic cable technologies. Uh, my question is, uh, how does FEMSA work with operators or other technology innovators to develop uh, and identify potential technologies for further attention in its regulatory processes? And secondly, what could Congress do uh, to help drive innovation and foster an environment uh, where operators can incorporate new technologies and best practices? Well, Congressman, um, thank you for the question. Uh, with regards to my tie, while it's not the beloved cream and crimson of my Hoosiers, at least it's Big Ten colors. So. Thank you. So you're welcome. Um, with regards to um, how we can continue to foster accelerated um, growth in technologies, especially technologies that provide greater safety. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think there are two important ways to do that. One is the absolute responsibility of, of FEMSA, and not only me, but the staff. I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of oil and gas executives, and it's probably one of the first points that I always make about the importance of 
safety technology and how we need to continue to invest. Again, not so much in safe R&D, but basically some of this step change safety that uh, will help, I think, get us this next level of safety. But I think the second part is, um, from the congressional point of view, I, I think, again, have this um, uh, great thirst to understand, I mean, to, to ask industry to come in and be very specific about their paths to more aggressive uh, implementation of this safety technology. I, you know, I came from the railroad industry where uh, we've seen tremendous improvements in technology and R&D, all designed to eliminate catastrophic causes of incidents that will create catastrophic uh, incidents, rail incidents, and I've seen the same thing in the pipeline incident. But I think the one thing that's missing is the, the ability to communicate that effectively to those people both on the regulatory side as well as the, the congressional side to fully understand what's going on and then to provide good recommendations about how all that good work can be. Pilot done. programs helpful? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Friedman, uh, as we've heard today, while FEMSA still has mandates uh, for the 2011 reauthorization unfinished, uh, they've made the most of the resources they have to bring uh, these complex technical rulemakings close to the finish line. Uh, however, as you noted in your testimony, states can play an important role in taking some of the burden off of FIMSA by assuming safety authority over inf uh, interstate gas pipelines. Like Ohio, uh, Michigan is one of only eight states that act as interstate agents and perform inspections. Um, can you describe how your relationship with FIMSA has impacted the overall safety and integrity of Ohio's pipeline system? In my discussions with the, uh, the, 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 the um, safety team uh, at the commission, uh, once again, um, anecdotally, that relationship, I think, is perceived by, by staff uh, to be very productive. To be mutually respectful, uh, and I, I, I believe there is in becoming an interstate agent uh, a, a, an assumption of responsibility uh, and an acknowledgement of the responsibility to promote the welfare of the uh, of uh, the citizens of Ohio. I would commend the state of Michigan for doing the same. Uh, I would believe that there is that same assumption of responsibility and acknowledgement at play there. Uh, I, I, I think, given the activities within the state of Ohio that, that, that I des hopefully described today, uh, you can appreciate the sheer magnitude of pipeline activity nationally. I mean, it is absolutely remarkable. There are in excess of two million miles of distribution, transmission, and, and gathering lines. Uh, in order to accept the charge of a regulator, responsibility of a regulator to promote general welfare, and, and the delivery of, of adequate and reliable uh, service and safe service, uh, I, I think the magnitude underscores the compelling need of the parties to act in a cooperative and coordinated fashion. And uh, I, I, again, I, I believe that the relationship between the PUCO and FIMSA is a clear demonstration of, of what can be accomplished okay. through that coordination. Thank you, I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairman Rush. Thank you for holding today's hearing. Uh, this topic is a very timely one for my district, uh, as two people tragically lost their lives and others were seriously injured as a result of an explosion originating from a natural gas line in Durham, North Carolina, uh, that occurred on the morning of April 10th of this year. Just received a news break just a few moments ago that there is yet another gas leak uh, in the 500 block of Duke Street there in Durham. We don't know the extent of it. Uh, the news reports are that no one has been injured, and that is, that is a good, good report. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Chairman, the explosion in Durham demonstrates just how important the safety and security of our pipelines are and how the work of this subcommittee to reauthorize the federal pipeline safety program is critically important. <clears throat> And let me thank the uh, three witnesses, but I will first address this question to the administrator. Uh, do you have any, any knowledge of the Durham explosion that I made reference to a moment ago? Well, Congressman, yes, I do. Can you elaborate on it for me, if, if you could? Uh, <clears throat> uh, Congressman and, and uh, uh, 
We were saddened to uh, learn of the second loss of life from this incident. Um, when incidents occur, and we're, we're very thankful that in the state of North Carolina, we have a very uh, good pipeline partner. Um, but what we typically do any time that there is a fatality, serious injury, or significant evacuations, we will dispatch members of our ac pipeline accident investigation division uh, to go in and assist the state. And I need to underscore that, assist the state, because they have the, uh, the predominant oversight. We know that uh, when we arrived, there was still some uh, kind of being treated as a fire scene and that, that other agencies were there as well. Um, we worked with our state partners, and I do know that one of the, one of the, the problems in helping and that's, that has prohibited us from basically understanding the, the specific point of damage with the distribution line is the damage to the building and the asbestos-containing material and the debris, so they've actually had to do an asbestos cleanup. Um, we know that they're getting close to being able to do the excavation of the actual distribution line that was hit by the boring machine. Our accident investigation team will be there again to assist the state. Uh, and then uh, once that area is uncovered, then that um, piece of pipe will go to, uh, typically go to a laboratory for analysis. Uh, so we'll continue to work with the state and to assist in the investigation any way we can. Well, based on your investigation thus far, do you believe that there, there could have been anything done to avoid this explosion? Well, um, you know, this was a case where uh, the excavation, putting in the, the, the fiber optics had done the one call, the lines one had been marked, but I think one of the determinations we're going to have to make uh, is whether or not this was an area where the, the operator would have been required to do an excavation to hand dig and look to make sure that the directional boring didn't strike the distribution line. So um, I think we will know more after the investigation is complete, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield to my friend from Iowa if he wants to consume some of my time. If not, I'll yield back. Uh, Go ahead. I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the chair for hosting this very important hearing to Texas 22, and welcome to our three panelists of the first panel. My first question is for Administrator Elliott. As you might know, I represent one of the fastest growing communities in the country. Mm -hmm. Our population in Texas 22 is booming. And in some areas, we have thousands and thousands of families who are living <coughs> where land that used to be rice, sugarcane farms, and cattle operations. That's made big changes for flood control, like Hurricane Harvey, but it's also put a challenge on pipeline safety. Clearly, there are pipelines all across Texas that used to be under wide open spaces that are now under families, feet, and schools. My district has that problem, that situation, over and over and over. I'd like to ask you about how inspections and quote unquote class location rules change as land above pipelines changes. Am I correct that there has been a rule in the works since 2013 and we work closely with Congress to make sure you all are taking this seriously? Um. So, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, with regards to how class location um, e evolves with the increase of population, as you know, there are several class locations. Um, uh, and as um, new growth occurs near a pipeline, then there are certain restrictions. And it is the responsibility of the operator to determine that growth. Are there now buildings and populations? Uh, and then they have the responsibility to do several things. One of them is to reduce the pressure uh, of the pipeline that is now going through this high consequence area, part of the class location. One question for you on your workforce. At breakfast this morning with a leader in the energy operations, somebody very touched the pipeline industry, and they're concerned because they admitted they poach your people. Your people are the best and brightest. They can pay them a lot more and you can pay them. Uh, Mr. Doyle and I have a bill that addresses this for FERC by authorizing them to have higher pay than the normal federal level. Would that be something them would like to have, have a little weapon to keep them? Because again, they admitted these are great people, we want them in our employ, and so we're poaching off of FEMSA. Well, um, 
certainly we are in competition with industry and when we do uh, hire uh, pipeline inspectors who typically have engineering degrees and after we put them through some of the best possible training, they even become more marketable to industry folks. So we're always looking at ways, Congressman, uh, to find new sources of recruiting. I mentioned uh, a little early ago our HR director he actually, uh, has actually been tasked to go into colleges and universities that have engineering programs and basically do a better job of selling the safety mission of PHMSA because I think that's attractive to a lot of folks. We continue to look at ways to incentivize uh, individuals that want to come to work for PHMSA. One of the most alarming things to me, for example, we had 10 um, uh, job offers out for pipeline engineers. 60% turned that offer down for various reasons. One, many of those are actually because they had better offers elsewhere. So I would, I guess that's a long way of saying uh, uh, we probably would encourage any help we could get to better incentivize pipeline so be inspectors. Okay, with more money, a higher, not the restrictions that are placed right now, something like SEC has to regulate securities and exchanges. You'd be okay with more money to pay these people, Mike. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I would be happy to see that, but given, I will work with whatever tools I have. Yes, sir. That's our toolbox to give you. Last question is Commissioner Friedman of Ohio. As Texas 22 grows. We know that a lot of new pipe is being built, especially for local distribution lines. You described in your testimony how one issue you face is replacing older existing lines. Can you talk about how pipeline technology has changed in recent years and what this means for safety and spill prevention? I think inherent in the, the replacement program is that First of all, it's an inevitably long duration um, because of the scope of the activity required. Uh, and a natural consequence of that is technological advancement as the program evolves. Uh, a, a, an illustration of that would be the composite material in plastic. Um, so it, it, there, there is a certain remedial nature when you have an accelerated main replacement program that identifies buckets and susceptibility. Uh, when you replace old infrastructure with new infrastructure, not only are you mitigating the risk associated with leakage, but what you are doing is replacing it with technologically improved composite material at the time, which should then extend the useful life beyond that which was historical. So, so th there's just an inherent benefit to a well-coordinated program. Uh, uh, thank you. I yield myself uh, five minutes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Elliott, I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, in your testimony, uh, you reiterated that the mission of uh, PHMSA is to protect people and the environment by advancing the safe transportation of energy products and other hazardous materials that are essential to our daily lives. Uh, and most of the time, we do pretty well at achieving this mission, but uh, incidents are too frequent, uh, and, and everybody knows that we have to do better. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, last year, uh, February the 23rd, Linda Rogers uh, was just 12 years old when she was killed by a natural gas leak and an explosion in her family's uh, home in the district that I represent uh, in Dallas. Uh, uh, and, and, and we know the difference between transmission uh, and distribution of natural gas and the different ap approaches to safety that are, re that are obviously required for each of those. Uh, but after this explosion, more than 300 nearby homes uh, were evacuated uh, due to uh, the quantity and severity of the natural gas leaks discovered in the residential neighborhood. And reports show that more than two dozen homes across the North Texas and Central Texas area have blown up since 2006 because of leaking uh, from natural gas pipelines. Uh, and tragically, uh, nine people have died and at least 22 others have been injured uh, badly. Uh, I appreciate you making clear in your testimony that completing the hazardous liquid rule, which includes installing leak detection system, is one of your highest priorities. Uh, do I have your commitment on making leak detection systems a priority in this rule? Yes. Uh, beyond uh, rulemaking effort, uh, there are recent pipeline industry recommended practices addressing pipeline safety systems, leak detection, and integrity management systems that have been developed by the American Petroleum Institute in response to recent disasters. 
Uh, what are you doing to incorporate industry recommended practices uh, into your regular scheme? Right. Well, Congressman, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, we're very aware of, of the tragic incident in Dallas with Atmos Energy. And, and similarly, we had in spent send inspectors and investigators to work with the Texas Railroad Commission. We continue to work with them on uh, some of the ongoing concerns. Um, uh, but we, we will, and, and with regards to the mandates, we will continue to uh, work to complete um, those that will bring the greatest safety value uh, to uh, not only protecting people, as you said, as well as the environment. Uh, do, you, do you have any programs or efforts to collect and promote uh, industry best practices? Well, and, and again, yes, and to that, so we regularly will look at uh, industry standards that have been in practice um, for a while that have shown uh, tangible uh, safety benefits, and we will then, uh, through incorporation, make those regulations. Uh, we have several of those that we're working on now to working on the language, and uh, several of those deal with pipeline safety. Okay, thank you. And just kind of switching gears, um, I wanted to ask, as you know, there's in, in today's pipeline technology, uh, we have a lot of uh, you know technologies being used for leak detection, you know different things like like that to make sure that the transmission of natural gas uh, is being done safely. What is being done? Because we've talked a lot about it on, on the grid, but you don't hear uh, hear it a lot as it relates to pipelines, like hacking. Uh, uh, the technology actually being compromised as it relates to transmission of natural uh, gas through pipelines? Well, um, I think as some of the, the discussion today has pointed out that you, know, you cannot separate safety and security. And, and while we uh, work every day to uh, improve safety, we understand we also have a responsibility where we can uh, to help improve security. And one of those areas actually that is ongoing now is we're trying to understand Congressman, how we can go into major pipeline control rooms that uh, control these uh, operations, some of them many thousands of miles in length, and perhaps be a little better armed to ask uh, the pipeline control room operators questions about their SCADIC security systems. Are they adhering to best practices within the cybersecurity realm? Uh, again, we don't profess to be the security organization, but I think we can probably do a better job of ensuring that we ask the right questions to help uh, understand that they are, in fact, doing that. Do you feel that the people that are actually providing the technology that the, that, who, the technology that the, uh, that's being provided uh, to the pipelines, that those companies are being uh, vetted enough and that, they're, and that, they, uh, that, the, that whatever that they're providing to these pipelines is... is is secure enough to make sure that any sort of hacking isn't taking place and that those companies aren't in, in, in somehow complicit with, with that? Yes, yeah, certainly outside of my real area of expertise, but I can tell you, I again, I, go, I fall back on my railroad experience because we had the same issue with dispatching of trains and you know the, the, the concerns about cybersecurity and, and positive train control. Um, and I will tell you, I have every reason to believe that the vetting of companies that are involved in providing that kind of uh, SCADA system, cybersecurity link, uh, I, I'm, I have no reason to believe that the oil and gas industry do not adequately vet those companies. Yeah. Thank you very much. You I appreciate come. you. Uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Elliott, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for being here with us today to examine uh, ways to increase the safety of our constituents and all Americans. Uh, while pipelines are the safest means of energy transportation, uh, unfortunately there are, are from time to time instances of failure. Uh, in these moments it's critical our first responders are trained and prepared to handle these dangerous situations. Uh, back home in North Carolina, some local and small fire stations don't have the budget to send their first responders to specific emergency pipeline safety. Last year, we had over 70 emergency responders take free online classes to receive pipeline emergency response training. Uh, by using technology, we're creating safer communities. In recent years, technology has been developed to internally scan pipelines to find issues and detect leaks before they become a problem. Um, I know a lot of the questions today have, have surrounded technology, but um, do you want to just more generally or add more detail to what FEMSA is doing to encourage pipeline operators to continue innovating and incorporating the most cutting edge technologies and best practices? Well, Congressman, uh, thank you for the question. And, and 
the, the first part of the discussion. I, I, I don't think we can ever do enough, especially in rural areas with volunteer fire service companies, to do enough in industry, whatever it may be, to train our emergency responders enough. Uh, we did that religiously in the rail industry, and I know the pipeline industry uh, have similar practices, but that's something I totally, totally support. Um, I, I do think, um, uh, again, I go back to the, the topic about technology and innovation. Um, again, I guess my, my one area, and I don't necessarily consider it a concern, but I think it's where we have to focus more, and that's through the oil and gas pipeline industry, is again to move away from what I consider to be safe R&D and to move into some of this, uh, some of the more research and development work that will deliver um, further safety enhancements. You know, the pipe we've talked about, and I very rarely anymore talk about the fact that the pipeline industry has a rate of 99.997% safety. And, and uh, having come from a heavily regulated industry, I'm of the belief that, that we're not necessarily going to be able to regulate that last little bit of safety. And it's going to come through adherence to certain regulatory items like integrity management. I think adherence to very comprehensive safety management systems that are less driven by regulation but more by the safety culture of the company. And I think continuing to drive and invest more in technology and R&D, again, that's, that's more step change than some of the traditional inline inspection R&D that's going on today. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we can have some of the best investments and in, in advancements in safety. I agree with you on that. Uh, would you support a pilot program or an alternative process that would allow FEMSA to work more closely with pipeline operators on some of this newer, safer technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the uh, criticisms that we've heard, rightfully so, from industry is we're too slow in allowing new safety technology to come to pass. You know, and as I've mentioned, we have to be absolutely sure that this, this new technology does, in fact, deliver uh, not only the ability to extend the life of the infra infrastructure and to um, be a surrogate for physical inspection, but it has to deliver safety value. And sometimes it takes us a little longer to understand that. Uh, I think our special permit process is good, but I think there are ways we can improve the ability to move good technology uh, into the application process faster than we're able to do it today. Appreciate that. Uh, do you have any recommendations for Congress on ways to encourage more early stage R&D to supplement the work that FEMS is doing today? Um, I mean, I do the best I can, so I'll take whatever encouragement Congress can offer to uh, provide greater uh, investment and focus on R&D. Well, I would just ask that maybe take that back and think about it. Um, you know, we, we would uh, eagerly uh, appreciate any advice you have uh, for ways we can partner with you, because I think we all agree, both sides of the aisle, we want uh, the, the, these innovative technologies. We want to continue to move in the direction uh, that you're describing, where we continue to be on the cutting edge of safety uh, and, and move as quickly as possible and, and to keep our, our community safe. So if you would take that back as some homework, and we'd love to have any feedback you might might bring back to us. That's the kind of homework I appreciate. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hudson. And now I yield five minutes to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bettigan. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today. Gentlemen, are, are any of you familiar with the 2015 oil spill in Santa Barbara? Yes? Yes. Mr. Elliott? Um, this was the Refugio State Beach um, spill? Yeah, the planes issue. Mm -hmm. All American planes. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me how something like this happens and where um, the pipeline safety program um, that PIMSA has, where do they fall into the picture of this, uh, this spill? Well, Congressman, thank you for the question, and, and undeniably, this was a um, significant impact. Matter of fact, I uh, just sat through a briefing that NOAA provided uh, last week that actually showed uh, kind of the impact from the, the point of origin where the oil uh, came underneath the highway and down the embankment and then out into the coast. Um, I, I do have to prefix my remarks by saying, as you know, it's, it's currently being litigated in the Department of Justice and involved in others. But I will tell you this, that uh, from the FIMSA point of view, um, 
we really see this as a case where our integrity management rules uh, and the responsibilities of um, um, this operator were not adhered to. And uh, were, were not adhered to in a pretty significant way. Well, there were multiple violations, right? And they weren't fixing what had to be fixed. Isn't that right? Um, uh, that is generally correct, yes. How are the American people supposed to tr trust pipeline companies who can't do the right thing and then end up having a spill where you have the California coastline, um, just you know, marine life, people, economy, and the huge impact? How are the American people supposed to trust um, when a company tells us day in and day out, hey, we're going to come in, we're going to put this in, it's going to be safe, nothing's going to happen. Uh, we hear the statistics on how safe it is. And then you see these examples where there's constant violations, um, they're not doing the right thing. People start asking, where's the oversight on this? Um, it's, it's hard for the American people to trust um, these pipeline companies, and it's hard as well when you hear that since that time, there hasn't been a lot done and there's been all these delays that are happening. Um, and so when you think about the president trying to open up new California coastline and the coastline in general to drilling, um, it's a huge concern, um, rightfully speaking, on after you take a look at uh, what has happened. Let me ask, the Trump administration's uh, requested budget uh, for FIMSA is roughly 8% less in 2020 than it was in 2019. How will that impact the pipeline safety program? And does it open us up to have more incidences of what happened in Santa Barbara if we're putting less money into it than more? Um, well, thank you uh, for that question. Very important points. Um, I want to comment on um, about what needs to be done for operators that don't follow the requirements. Um, I think it's true in any case, and at least from my experience in a, a year and a half at FIMSA, that there's a spectrum. Um, there are some extremely good, conscientious operators, and we're very thankful, we, thankful that they're there. And I understand the issue of public trust. All it takes is one operator to kind of dispel that trust. Um, I think here, anyway, the process is working probably as it should in that uh, there were a number of parties to uh, the investigation uh, against planes and even criminal uh, investigation and penalty. And again, I can't really get into it, but some you know, discussions ongoing about what the impact will be to planes with regards to a settlement. Um, but regards to... Um, you know, regards to um, the budget cuts, is, is the eight percent budget yeah. cut going to make it so I, more likely, less likely? I mean, how is it going to impact the, the pipeline safety program? You know, I, I work um, in my prior career to make sure that every dollar we have is effective in allowing us to, to conduct our safety mission, and I, I really see that we're able to do that at FEMSA. It, it is, it is. Mr. Elliott, I, I only have ten seconds left. Is an 8% cut in the budget going to help safety in the pipeline safety program, yes or no? Is it going to help it? So I will make sure that there is no degradation in FEMSA's ability to conduct its safety mission with the dollars that are provided to us, whatever that may be. Well, I, don't, I don't have a lot of confidence in that, but thank you for I responding. I yield back. Uh, thank you. And now I yield, uh, yield five minutes to the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. McNorris Rogers. Thank you. I thank, uh, I thank the chairman for the time and appreciate all the witnesses being here. I think it's been a, a really important discussion, a discussion both on current standards and regulations and how we're doing as far as meeting those, those standards, but also looking at how do we do this in a smarter way and embracing innovation and, and technology and, and the solutions that are before us because we all want to make sure that we are keeping our community safe and our uh, shoreline safe from these kind of uh, uh, situations. I wanted to ask, Mr. Elliott, I just wanted to ask, uh, coming from a rural area, I wanted to dig a little deeper into how do you approach 
uh, pipelines in highly populated areas versus the rural areas where there's um, less people in development. And, you know, we have class location requirements for pipeline pipelines located in areas where we've seen recent population growth. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how do you how do you go about the rural versus the more populated and and my colleague here from Texas talked about his growing area too. Well thank you for the question and um, certainly there's uh, an important dichotomy between um, oil and gas pipelines in, in populated versus rural area. And um, I really believe it, it, it falls back to the absolute importance of adherence to uh, the pipeline and safety, uh, pipeline hazardous material safety administration's integrity management rules that require pipeline operators to have uh, an absolute adequate understanding of all the operations within their network, whether or not it's in a high consequence area or a rural area, to, to make sure that um, that line is operating in as safe as fashion as possible and that they're doing the appropriate inspections to ensure that any concerns that might be due to um, weld issues or lack of cathodic protection or corrosion are found and addressed long before they're ever in impact. So, and I think, uh, I think that our integrity management uh, rules have been extremely effective over the years in making sure that uh, holding uh, operators accountable for, for understanding the health of their pipeline uh, throughout their network, regardless of whether or not it's rural or high populated. Well, and would you also speak just to what are the pr procedures that you have in place to determine the risk? Um, because whether it's rural or uh, a growing area or what you know, happened on the California coast, what are the procedures that you are in place to address well, again, that all, uh, for the most part, falls back to um, the operator and the application of their integrity management system. But one of the items that we do do at FIMSA, I mean, we do our own risk assessment to make sure that we adequately uh, work with operators to do inspections of uh, gas and oil pipeline systems, both in rural and uh, high density areas. Uh, again, uh, with uh, limited resources, we, we use kind of a risk analysis. We look at the past history of the operator. We look at uh, past incidents of problems with that pipeline. That helps us set our inspection process to look at these lines. Can, can, would you update me on the, the review? I understand there's been a review underway since 2013 on the class location requirements. So um, the, the class location uh, rulemaking uh, that we're working on, we put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to seek comment about uh, whether or not um, uh, industry could use certain uh, integrity management tools in lieu of having to take additional steps in, in the higher level um, class locations, the high density area. In other words, uh, can some of this technology and sophisticated inline inspection capability replace uh, the ability to have to reduce certain pipeline pressures? Okay. Um, and I think it was mentioned earlier, and rightfully so, I mean, some of the growth is basically um, expanding so rapidly that it's, it's difficult to basically uh, take some of the steps that are currently part of the class location program. So we're uh, working through a notice of proposed rulemaking that will help us understand more fully can we somehow apply uh, additional integrity management inspection process to higher class locations uh, as we see population growth. Okay. Uh, I had one more question, um, and this was to Mr. Russell, but I too am uh, uh, frustrated that TSA is not here, and I, I guess I'll, I'll ask this final question to uh, on the record. So Thank you very much. I've run out of time. I yield back. Are there any more questions? Uh, if not, that concludes our first panel. I would like to thank our witnesses for joining us today to testify on this very important issue. And at this time, I ask staff to prepare the witness table such that we may begin our second panel shortly. Thank you. Thank you, participants.
We will now hear from a second panel of private sector stakeholders. Those witnesses include uh, Mr. Carl Weimer, Executive Dir Director of the Pipeline Safety Trust, Mr. Andrew Black, President and CEO of Association of Pipelines, and Ms. Christina Sames. Ms. Christina Sames, Vice President, Operation and Engineering Services, American Gas Association. Uh, we want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. And at this time, the chair will recognize Mr. Weimer for five minutes to provide his opening statement. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Rush and Ranking Member uh, Upton for inviting me to speak today on pipeline safety. And for th I'd also like to thank this committee uh, for continuing this bipartisan effort to protect people and the safety of America, as you always do. Before we get into various pipeline safety issues, let me give you a brief overview of where we stand today regarding the safety of pipelines in this country. While everyone testifying today supports the goal of zero incidents, we still have a long way to go to reach that goal. According to PHMSA data, since the Pipes Act was signed less than three years ago, there has been over 1,700 reportable pipeline failures. Of those failures, nearly 800 are considered significant incidents under PHMSA's definitions, and the number of significant incidents has been increasing over the past decade. For the past 15 years, the emphasis in reducing pipeline incidents has been focused on performance-based integrity management programs in high-consequence areas. Unfortunately, it would appear that these integrity management programs have not yet lived up to their promise, as significant incident rates within high-consequence areas continue to climb for hazardous liquid and gas transmission pipelines. The pipeline safety system that Congress has created also plays a part in PHMSA's inability to get things done. One large barrier to getting better regulations in place is the cost versus benefit analysis that Congress has uniquely created for PHMSA. With a large pipeline system where the probability of a failure is low but the consequences can be huge, it is nearly impossible to pass regulations under the current cost-benefit rules. If you are really interested in long-standing issues such as effective leak detection, automated shutoff valves, regulation of over 400,000 miles of totally unregulated gathering lines, then the cost-benefit language in the statute needs to be fixed. PHMSA's penalty authority also results in civil penalties that are economically insignificant to many operators and are much smaller than those imposed by some states. The wording in the statute for criminal penalties also does not align with the better wording for PHMSA's hazmat operations and creates a very high bar to prove. We have provided suggested changes to the statute that can give PHMSA more flexibility and penalty assessment in the ability to bring criminal charges on companies in the rare cases where that is warranted. As currently written, the pipeline safety statutes do not prohibit the release of gas or hazardous liquid from a pipeline. Under current PHMSA rules, as determined by recent court rulings, an operator can cause a significant incident without necessarily having violated a safety regulation. In other words, under PHMSA's rules, an operator has to have a plan for operating and testing their pipeline, but they don't necessarily have to have a plan that works. To close that loophole, we ask that you add language to make clear that the intent of the statute is to avoid releases of gas or hazardous liquids. In the Pipes Act, Congress asked GAO to produce important reports on the integrity management program for both natural gas and hazardous liquid pipelines after the new PHMSA rules, which they have been working on since 2010, are published. Since those rules have yet to be published and may be delayed further, these important reports are not yet due. The current integrity management rules have been in place for over a decade, are well understood, and NTSB has done a study on its effectiveness. So we ask that Congress direct GAO to produce these important reports as soon as possible instead of waiting for the proposed rules. Congress should also ignore industry calls for a relaxation of class location rules because of integrity management is in place until the GAO reports are done and the number of incidents under integrity management show a downward trend. Also in the Pipes Act, Congress directed PHMSA to make it clear that the Great Lakes, coastal beaches, and marine coastal waters are considered unusually sensitive areas. This mandate is yet to be accomplished. The need to do this came as a surprise to us since clearly these are unusually sensitive. We were also surprised to learn that PHMSA does not currently have a way to define and map all such areas. 
Congress should also ask GAO to do a study of whether PHMSA's definitions and identification of such areas, along with commercially navigable waterways, are consistent with other environmental regulations and whether PHMSA currently has GIS data layers that allow the agency and the industry to know where such boundaries are, uses this data to ensure pipeline operators are accurately identifying these areas. Congress should also mandate that such areas be made public so state and local governments, along with the public, can ensure that PHMSA and pipeline companies are considering these important areas. I see that my time is about up, so I want to thank you again for asking me to testify today, and I stand ready to help answer any questions and work on reauthorization. Thank you, Mr. Weimer. Uh, Mr. Black, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. I'm Andy Black, President and CEO of the Association of Oil Pipelines. AOPL represents liquid pipeline owners and operators transporting crude oil, refined products like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and home heating oil, and industrial products like propane and ethane. We have over 55 member companies which deliver over 21 billion barrels annually, over a 215,000 mile network of pipelines. I'm also testifying on behalf of the American Petroleum Institute, which represents all facets of the oil and natural gas industry, including exploration and production, refining, marketing, and pipeline and marine transportation. Pipelines are the safest way to deliver the liquid energy we all need and use every day. No other mode of transportation is as safe for the American people or the environment as pipelines. And pipelines are getting safer. Over the last five years, pipeline operators have reduced the number of liquid pipeline incidents impacting people in the environment by 20%. This is government data publicly available from PHMSA. PHMSA data also shows pipeline incidents caused by incorrect operation impacting people in the environment are down 38% over the last five years, and pipeline incidents caused by corrosion, cracking, or weld failures impacting people in the environment are down 35% over that period. The member companies of AOPL and API work hard to improve pipeline safety. We're transparent about where we're doing well and where we can do better. The statistics I just shared come from the performance report we develop jointly each year analyzing pipeline safety data. We use this analysis to guide our industry-wide pipeline safety programs, focusing on key safety issues as we strive towards the goal of zero incidents. Through this strategic effort, the pipeline industry has addressed key safety recommendations from Congress, PHMSA, the NTSB, and issues identified through analysis of safety data. Recent safety accomplishments include developing new best practices for finding and fixing cracking in pipelines, managing leak detection programs, responding to pipeline emergencies, and applying safety management systems to pipelines. API also just released an updated best practice for inspecting and performing maintenance on pipelines using the latest inspection technologies and analytical techniques. Harnessing technology to advance pipeline safety is a theme we're pursuing across industry, and we recommend Congress adopt as well. For example, high-tech tools can travel inside a pipeline, scanning it like an MRI or an ultrasound at the doctor's office. Pipeline operators have the opportunity to find issues early, perform preventative maintenance, and keep pipelines operating safely. The problem is federal regulations can't keep pace with fast-moving technology innovations. Outdated PHMSA regulations sometimes conflict with the latest knowledge and techniques. Congress can do more to allow PHMSA and pipeline operators to improve safety by harnessing technology and innovation, such as creating a pilot program to test pipeline safety technologies and approaches. We were thrilled to hear Administrator Elliott say absolutely when asked if he was interested. Authorizing a voluntary information pro sharing program, encouraging joint stakeholder problem solving, requiring regular PHMSA and stakeholder review of pipeline safety research and development advances, improving the approval process for alternative safety technologies, and encouraging voluntary discovery, disclosure, correction, and prevention of pipeline safety violations. Next, protecting public safety and the environment from attacks on pipelines is a top reauthorization priority for us. Pipelines are the safest way to deliver the energy American families and consumers use every day, but they are industrial facilities. Recent attacks on pipelines by churning valves or attempting to damage the pipeline itself are dangerous. Members of the public, surrounding communities, and the environment are put in danger by attacks on pipeline facilities that could easily result in a spill. Congress should deter future attacks against pipeline facility by closing loopholes in the scope of criminal federal liability in, in federal pipeline safety law 
put by previous Congresses on a bipartisan basis. OPL and API also recommend improving FEMSA programs and regulations by easing hiring and retention of FEMSA inspectors, which we discussed on the first panel, improving due process and enforcement proceedings, tailoring requirements to pipeline operating status, adjusting incident reporting requirements for inflation, and incorporating the latest best practices on inspection repair and tank maintenance. I look forward to answering any of your questions on these proposals, our pipeline safety performance record, or the action operators are taking to improve pipeline safety further. Thank you. Uh, now, the chair wants to recognize Ms. Sams for five minutes. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and the esteemed members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm Christina Sams, Vice President of Operations and Engineering at the American Gas Association. Prior to AGA, I worked for the Pipeline Research Council International, which is a research consortium, and also spent 12 years within FEMSA's Office of Pipeline Safety, where I worked on everything from regulations on damage prevention to unusually sensitive areas, and initiatives like well, community assistance, the pipeline mapping program, and moving damage prevention forward. AGA represents more than 200 local energy companies that deliver natural gas to 74 million natural gas customers. Natural gas pipelines deliver gas through 2.5 million miles of pipeline, including 2.2 million miles of local distribution pipe. The gas utilities distribution pipelines are the last critical link to the delivery chain that brings natural gas from the wellhead to the burner tip. AGA's members live in the communities they serve and interact daily with both customers and regulators to oversee pipeline safety locally. Our customers are our neighbors, our friends, and our family members. The industry uses a variety of tools to ensure the integrity of their distribution systems. This includes prescriptive and risk-based regulations along with voluntary actions. The key risk-based regulation used by operators is distribution integrity management a regulatory process that allows an operator to develop a unique safety plan specific to that system's operating characteristics and risks, to determine how best to mitigate those risks and to prioritize the work that needs to be done. The process strengthens the systems and improves safety. Upgrading distribution pipeline systems is important to safety and reliability. We currently have 43 states in the District of Columbia that have expedited pipeline replacement programs. And over the past 20 years, the amount of cast iron and bare steel in use has declined dramatically. Replaced by modern pipelines, with, which increase safety system, system safety and reliability. The distribution integrity industry, the distribution industry has proven it can simultaneously increase delivery and improve safety. Since the data shows that distribution incidents have declined as the mileage and consumers have increased. But while we've come a long way, recent tragic incidents demonstrate nor needs to be done. The April 10th incident in Dorm, North Carolina, was caused by third-party excavation damage, which continues to be the primary cause of distribution incidents. The tragic incident in Merrimack Valley was unprecedented. While the NTSB is still investigating, they have stated the cause was overpressurization of a low-pressure gas distribution system. Post-incident, AGA immediately brought together industry experts and published a shared and shared technical paper capturing leading practices to prevent overpressurization. AGA created a board-level task force to escalate our existing pipeline safety efforts and determine what more can be done. We hosted a crisis leadership and communication summit and developed a technical paper that covers the skills required to perform engineering work on a natural gas system. AGA's member safety efforts exceed expectations and regulations. The AGA board adopted a commitment to enhancing safety that lists specific activities above and beyond regulation. We participate in peer reviews, benchmarking activities, safety summit, and other industry programs to enhance safety. 
Relative to reauthorization, AGA asks the subcommittee to consider three high-level principles. Preserve industry engagement in pipeline safety rulemaking by upholding the FIMSA regulatory process. Support flexibility in rulemaking by recognizing that the gas distribution system differs and avoid one-size-fits-all regulations. Don't obstruct pipeline safety replacement programs via new mandates that delay pipeline replacement or require a replacement faster than work can be accomplished, safely, reliably, and without compromising quality. Our full statement covers several pipeline safety reauthorization topics. We would like to highlight how integral FIMSA's Gas Pipeline Advisory Committee process is to the pipeline safety rulemaking. Providing stakeholders supporting vital roles, which includes input from subject matter experts, actually accelerates rulemaking and their implementation. We also support the GPAC cost-benefit analysis process. To the best of AGA's knowledge, not one single rulemaking has been held up by this process. More importantly, cost-benefit analysis protects the public as regulatory costs are ultimately borne by the customers. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. I look forward to your questions. Mr. Chair, I want to thank all the witnesses for the opening uh, statements. This concludes our opening statements, and we will move uh, now to member questions. And I will start by recognizing my friend, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy. Uh, Pittsburgh's had a record amount of rain over the past year that's caused flooding and landslides throughout our region. Um, as recently as of September of 2018, a landslide in neighboring Beaver County caused a pipeline to explode, uh, and one house was completely destroyed, and 30 more homes had to be evacuated. Um, we know that extreme weather will continue because of uh, climate change. Mr. Black and, and Ms. Sams, how does the industry take into account extreme weather events and earth movements and how does industry plan to adapt uh, as we're seeing more and more of this severe weather? Uh, pipeline operators face requirements today to be aware of that operating environment, earth movements, uh, any change. So there's a current requirement right now for that pipeline operator to uh, have understood what stress might be placed on a pipeline by land movement. We have a practice in information sharing among our industry, and uh, we'll bring pipeline operators together to tell stories about uh, incidents or near misses or precautions that were taken based on that information. Uh, if the climate continues to change, uh, pipeline operators right now continue, will continue to be uh, faced with those requirements and ongoing practices to assess that operating environment. Ms. Sams. Congressman Doyle, I'm actually from the Pittsburgh area originally. I'm very familiar with all the rain you've had, um, <laughs> along with other areas of the country. So we look at a variety of things. We're looking at new flood mapping that's coming out. We're monitoring the weather. We're putting sensors on our lines uh, to look for ground movement. Um, we've been doing this for a while in areas where we have seismic activity, but we're looking at it now for other areas because we're seeing changes. And with changes, you have to adapt. So operators are now including this more in their distribution integrity management plans. Mr. Warmer, how about you? What should be done to properly address climate adaption and resiliency? Yes, thanks for the question. Um, you, clearly, the pipeline operators are supposed to be have control of their pipeline. And under integrity management, they're supposed to look at risks and find out how to mitigate those risks. I think as we've seen with uh, as changing weather, whether it's river scours that cause two two uh, releases into the Yellowstone River. In your area, in the Midwest, there's been a number of big failures because of ground movement flooding. Um, in Texas, there's been failures because of a wet soil. Um, uh, when the NTSB looked at integrity management, they thought it was working pretty well for things like corrosion, but wasn't working very well for some of these other threats that are harder to find. Um, so I think we need to get a better handle in the industries working on some of that. We also need to think about it when we're siting pipelines. You know, it doesn't make much sense to put a pipeline on the side of a hill that can fail. Um, so some of the routing of some of those pipelines needs to be considered too. How about, um, you know, Pennsylvania has a history of coal mines where we were a coal producing state and we have many abandoned mines throughout our state. So uh, subsidence is also a 
concern for energy infrastructure, how's the subsidence and geological formations taken into account? Well, the one good thing with distribution lines is many of them are plastic, which means they have a little bit more flexibility to, to, to move with the ground. Uh, it only goes so far, um, which means that where you have a sudden change, a sudden drop, a sudden sinkhole, which you do experience in Pennsylvania and a few other areas, you're focusing on emergency response. How do you quickly shut off the gas to that area um, when there's a when there's a subsidence that's so fast and so dramatic that it causes the pipeline to break. Uh, thinking about your question, Congressman, on rivers, uh, the industry updated a recommended practice on waterway crossings to address a river scour issue. What once was a recommended practice just about calm coastal areas has now been upgraded to address the river scour issues. Uh, pipeline operators have to take those responsibilities seriously and do. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. I appreciate the courtesy you've shown me, and I'll yield back. Ladies and gentlemen, for you and the chair, the chair now recognizes Mr. Upton for five minutes. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panelists for waiting. Aren't you glad we don't have three panels, right? Uh, a couple of questions. Sam, to, to follow up on what you just said, and I was going to ask about new technologies as we look, you know, as we look at this uh, next bill and. Uh, there's been some questions raised about, you know, sort of like plastic and paper, plastic and steel. So you indicated that plastic is emerging, uh, volume-wise, I guess you could say, in a lot of new pipelines. Can you talk a little bit about the advantage or disadvantage and, and where do you think plastic is as it relates to steel and what, what hurdles might be there and help us? In case it's not obvious, you start talking technology. With my background, I start getting really excited. Um, so plastic now takes, uh, t accounts for more than 50% of the distribution pipe. Um, that's increasing because we're replacing the cast iron and bare steel. And that's primarily in gas because oil right. really doesn't work, right? Still coated steel. Yes, yeah. Congressman. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. That's fine. Uh, so some of the benefits of plastic, and it only goes up to a certain size, which is why you see on the liquid lines and the interstate lines really coated steel. But on plastic, on distribution, pl uh, we use a lot of plastic because it's flexible. Um, it's easier to insert. It's not subject to corrosion. Um, it, so there's a lot of benefits that we see with it. And the product has come a lot way since the initial... Uh, the initial products back in the 60s and 70s. Um, so we're seeing a, a shelf life, uh, a, a lifespan of these plastics, these newer plastics. They're predicting well over 100 years. That's pretty darn good. Uh, the downside of plastic is- what, What's the cost difference between? Uh, definitely cheaper. Substantial, mm -hmm. is it substantial? Right, which, right, so the customers are bearing that, that cost benefit. Um, which is why you see bills so low right now between the cost of natural gas and, and being able to use plastic. It's a lot cheaper. Uh, the one downside with plastic uh, is an issue that we continue to struggle with, with which is third-party damage. The dorm incident, third-party damage again. Um, so if you all could find a way to stop the telecoms, the water, and the sewer lines from hitting us, I would greatly appreciate it. Mr. Black, do you want to comment on it at all or not? Well, we're excited about uh, technology advances, if they're not in plastics and the liquids, but they are uh, about inline inspection technologies and leak detection technologies. We've encouraged Congress to uh, direct PHMSA to implement a pilot program allowing for real world testing of technology and applications. We think that will give them more information that they need so that they can uh, update regulations to advance technology. Uh, in the last Congress, uh, both Mr. Black's and Ms. Sames uh, organization submitted letters of support for our action to strengthen DOE's cybersecurity program for pipelines. We appreciated that. Uh, this bill has now been introduced, reintroduced as HR 370, Pipeline and LNG Facilities Cyber, uh, Cybersecurity Preparedness Act. Uh, can you continue to support that? I don't know if you've taken another look at it. It really hasn't changed, but we would, let me just say, we would welcome your support, written support for this uh, 
a, a second time. We do support that bill. It gives DOE a great coordination role, uh, which I think is very much needed. So yes, you continue to have our support. We were glad to support that bill to help it get through the committee process. Cybersecurity is important. We encourage all of Congress to work on this a holistic approach with energy, transportation, and intelligence-related committees. Important goal is not having duplication and conflicting sets of guidance that could set operators back. Great. Thank you. I yield back. For yielding, the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Weimer, uh, so good to see you again. Before the subcommittee, uh, you have provided your expertise to the members of this subcommittee uh, on pipeline safety, uh, reauthorization efforts, and we certainly appreciate you being here once again with us. In your testimony, you stated that since the year 2010, despite all the high-profile pipelines incidents, congressional directives, and then TSB and GAO recommendations, FEMSA is incapable of producing major new safety rules, mostly due to the unique and overly burdensome cost benefit requirements that the agency must adhere to. Why do you call the cost benefit requirement of, for FEMSA unique, and how does it contribute to the agency's inability to implement significant new rule makers even when they are directed to do so by law? Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman Rush. Um, yes, I, I'm on the gas advisory committee for FIMSA, and we have another board member who's a law professor at the University of Arkansas who's on the, uh, the gas Pub advisory committee. I'm on the liquid advisory committee. Um, both of these committees often focus on the cost benefit. Um, it was put into the statute in the mid-90s, um, and FIMSA, just because of timing efforts, was one of the few places where the cost benefit um, requirements landed. We don't have a problem with cost benefit. We think it makes sense to consider the cost versus the benefits, and that's already required under executive um, orders. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the uniqueness in the statute where the industry can, because of the, uh, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, can legally challenge that. And uh, the cost benefit is the only place we know of it is in the FIMSA statute. Other places like EPA and some other agencies have mention of cost benefit, but it, it is not, uh, they don't have to justify the cost the way FIMSA does. Even a former administrator, just uh, two administrators back, has recently said that one of her frustrations as administrator was trying to get rules passed because of the cost benefit statute. Um, and you see it slowing things down because FIMSA doesn't always have enough data to justify the costs because they have to get that data from the industry. So the industry comes forward with any rulemaking and says things are going to cost billions and billions of dollars and FIMSA really can't argue with that. Good information to know. The committee should certainly take, uh, take that into consideration, but it shouldn't be the only way you can get a rule passed. What kind of corrective strategies would you recommend that the Congress take? Well, I think in our testimony, we provided some uh, red line version of what cost benefit language got put into the statute in the 90s, and we recommend that that be removed to make it more of an even playing field with just about every other statute we see. Uh, uh, you feel very strongly about the need for enacting minimum standards for the 430. 35,000 miles of natural gas gathering lines tra traversing uh, our nation. And one of the dangers, in your opinion, of leaving those lines unregulated. Thank you for that question. It's, it's pretty amazing as the shale plays have turned out in this country, especially in places like Pennsylvania. Um, you know, rapidly, there was hundreds of thousands of miles of new gathering lines put in. 
A lot of those shale plays have pressures coming out of the ground at much higher pressure, so the pipelines going in are larger and much higher pressure. They're basically the same as gas transmission pipelines that are already fairly, fairly well regulated. These pipelines run right past homes. Even in rural areas, they run past cl clusters of homes. Where it failed, it would be the same as a failure of a gas transmission pipeline. And in most places, they are completely and totally unregulated. So, you know, to, to prevent failure so people don't show up in front of this committee again with the latest failure, uh, minimum standards for these gathering lines need to be enacted. Uh, my time is up. Uh, I certainly want to thank you very much. The chair now recognizes Mr. Atlanta from Ohio for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our panel of witnesses today for appearing. Mr. Black, if I could uh, start with you. you. You said something kind of interesting that we talk about in this committee a lot. Energy and Commerce is a great committee. We have very broad jurisdiction. We think it's the best committee in Congress, and it, I not only think, we believe it. But uh, you said something that we, we, we really believe, because we, what we see in this committee are technologies and inventions uh, that are really five to ten years out. And so one of the things we have to be careful when we're uh, you know, working on legislation is to make sure that uh, we're not hindering uh, the, the progress out there in the community. And you'd mentioned that um, uh, on you know, making sure that the federal regulations you know, keep pace in what you're all doing out there. But what I'd like to do is, uh, my first question, I'd like you to go, if you would, further expand on your testimony and comments regarding a pilot, the uh, pilot program to test cutting edge safety technologies. And would you tell us about the, what new, those new technologies are and are available out there and how they might offer the opportunity for further improvement for pipeline safety? I'll give you one example. Pipeline integrity management regulations uh, are almost 20 years old. That's before the iPhone. Uh, we had smart pigs then, but they weren't nearly as smart as they are now. Right now, there's improved technologies that travel inside the pipeline collecting data. At the same time that we now have terabytes of data on pipeline features, whereas we didn't before, we also have uh, better analytical techniques to know what that increased information tells us. Yet, the FEMSA regulations are almost 20 years old and are not up to date. So the latest know-how and techniques on prioritizing risks in pipelines is not what PHMSA is requiring operators to do. Uh, the repair criteria updates are not in uh, what we understand would be the next hazardous liquids rule that is moved. Uh, we can see PHMSA uh, needing real-world experiences from a controlled environment by selecting pipeline operators to test any new technologies. It could be leak detection technologies. It could be uh, re scheduling repairs and maintenance under new analytical techniques. If they can gather information like that, they can have more confidence to update regulations in the manner that they should with equivalent or better level of safety, and maybe they won't be so slow. When you're just, I assume you have discussions with PHMSA on a frequent basis. When you bring this up to them, what do they say about upgrading those uh, regulations to bring this new technology out? Well, they know that it's important to us that integrity management regulations uh, be updated. Uh, you've heard Administrator Elliott say that he is open to pilots. Uh, we hope that this would be an issue that they would work on. Uh, they also have the special permit process, which has been cumbersome and slow and only allows one operator to get a waiver for an equivalent level of safety or better. Uh, it's maybe ill-suited to pipeline integrity management regulations, but it's something that we need to consider with them. Uh, the industry just released API recommended practice 1160. That's all about performing maintenance and repairs on pipelines. And as the administrator said, they have a goal we all have a goal in avoiding uh, spending resources on issues that aren't high priority and making sure that we are on high priority. Whatever it takes, whether it's congressional action or a pilot program or a repair permit or a rulemaking, we need to update those regulations. Thank you. Uh, just continuing on this, uh, this topic, we know that the technology is ever-changing and adapting, but uh, again, uh, what do you, how, how do we get to that point? Uh, of, of working with the, with the agency to make sure we get those, those technologies out there? Well, we found the model uh, in the motor carrier statute for the Department of Transportation. They have the authority to do this pilot program. 
Uh, and if Congress directs them to do that and creates that authority, hopefully that's something that they will create. Uh, we also have rich exchanges on research and development advances. They are funding research and development. We are funding research and development. Uh, the collaboration between the two is episodic and not as good as it should be. One of our proposals is that Congress direct FIMSA to review its research and development programs and have us do it within the, mention, the uh, entities that Mr. Weimer was describing, the Liquid and Gas Pipeline Advisory Committees. If you put that in the statute, that that's something that FEMSA should be doing, we believe that will maybe force more regular and frequent and fast discussions of R&D advances, because we share the same goal, of zero incidents, improving pipeline safety and technology. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, and I yield back. I want to thank the gentleman for your name, man. Uh, Mr. Wahlberg is right. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Olson, uh, recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome to the second panel. I want to start by thanking each of you and organizations for your performance, the pipeline performances during Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey hit Southeast Texas in late August of 2017. Parts of my home received five feet of rain over two days. The largest petrochemical complex in the world is long the Houston Ship Channel, which is 52 miles long. It is America's largest export port for the last 10 years. All that product comes from Eagleford, Permian Basin, somewhere else. It got there without a major spill, major incident. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hurricane Harvey shows how safe you guys are. My first question is for you, Mr. Black, you, Mr. Sams. Um, as I mentioned in the first panel, Texas 22 is booming. One example, our population we think will be over one million people for the next census. It's grown almost 30% in the last 10 years. As the population keeps increasing, people are moving to areas that were rural before. There were pipelines there. And so, and as again, all that traffic flowing, the Port of Houston, Port of Freeport, coming from the West Permian Basin, flows through Fort Bend County. You can't get there without Fort Bend County. So can y'all please talk about how the industry works with new communities as they're built around existing pipelines. How to make sure the first responders and others know what the risks are. Mr. Black? Well, you're certainly right, Congressman, that not only is the population of that area in your district growing, uh, but the benefits within Texas of increased oil and gas production are helping Houstonians and others have uh, benefit from lower price, more availability to, uh, to U.S. and North American supplies. Uh, it's important for us to expand pipeline capacity to help uh, feed those needs and to make sure that the public along the existing route is aware of pipelines that are there. Uh, we are ready to work with anybody that is constructing a pipeline to make sure that they are safely uh, not threatening the pipeline. The call before you dig program and public awareness programs uh, are very important. Mr. Sam, your comments, ma'am. Well, in addition to what Andy said, uh, there is also the Pipeline Informed Planning Alliance document that helps to helps communities as they're building around existing pipelines. There's a lot of great practices in there. It was a collaborative effort that included, you know, the Pipeline Safety Trust, the oil industry, the gas industry, uh, emergency responders, governors, cities. I lost count of how many. It's a good document. And it really provides guidance around how communities can build safely around these existing pipelines, these larger existing pipelines. Um, simple things like if you're building a school near an existing pipeline, put the parking lot near the pipeline, not the school. But also make sure that there is a good exit so that when people, if something happens in that small stretch, that they have an escape route. It's things like that that are within the document. Hopefully they'll consider it. And I thank you too, because pipelines provide green space all over Fort Bend County and Brazoria County. The park right by my house, the biggest park my hometown of Sugarland has, is built over the existing pipeline. The markers are all along the park, but it's a park and people are there, they're flying kites, they've got this little 
uh, dirt bike trail. That's because the pipelines there, that land's available, would have been taken up, but that pipeline gave us green space, so thank you for that. I want to get back to the staffing issues I talked about with them in the first panel. Um, you know, they can't function without the right agents, the right people in place. And uh, sometimes I mentioned they get poached because their people are so good. Uh, Mr. Doyle left, but he and I have a bill to give FERC a sort of waiver to keep employees, pay them higher than average federal salary. That's happened for the SEC. Would you support that going to FEMSA, having them have more financial resources to keep the people they've got? I'll tell you about the proposal that we have made to the Congress on this and the committee. Uh, we understand that if FEMSA had Schedule A hiring authority for its inspectors, they would be able to uh, better attract and retain pipeline operators. From what we have learned about the federal personnel process, that would help. It is in all of our interest for FEMSA to be able to have quality inspectors on the job. I haven't studied your bill, I'm happy to do that. But uh, the spirit of being able to have FEMSA maintain quality inspectors is one we support. Thank you. One final comment, uh, and this is a question for you, um, Mr. Black. Are the hard frogs gonna be the suitors this year at football? Well, as a TCU grad, they should every year. Yes, sir. This is the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the panel. Um, uh, Mr. Black and, and uh, Ms. Sames, I, I, I think you share some of the frustrations regarding FEMSA's inability to comply with congressional mandates uh, relating to pipeline safety rulemakings. Uh, in your view, uh, what's keeping FEMSA from complying with deadlines on their significant rulemakings? Mr. Black. Congressman, uh, we believe there was a strategic mistake by the last administration to lump many large complex issues into a few mega rulemakings. The rulemaking process is not built for that. We believe that they should have separated them out, and the administrator has acknowledged that, and, and that's what they're doing. We don't believe cost-benefit requirements are what delayed those rules. Now, certainly, if a proposal is overly broad, uh, it deserves to be reviewed further. We think the American people who ultimately pay the cost of regulations deserve to know that the benefits outweigh the costs. And we think cost-benefit analysis uh, improves regulations. Lastly, some of the proposals that we've seen to remove cost-benefit from the FEMSA statute risks, number one, later uh, longer delays because the Office of Management Budget might return something to FEMSA that hasn't had cost-benefit analysis. And two, I'd hate to end the requirement that a risk-benefit analysis and a cost-benefit go before the, pipe, the public advisory committee that Carl and our industry reps are on. Those are great discussions to improve regulations. But we think to answer your question, it's been mistakes of just lumping too many things in mega rules. That's why they were delayed. Okay. They're recovering now. Ms. Sames, uh, any additions there? I fully agree with Mr. Black, but in addition, uh, just an observation. It, it's my, obs my opinion, my observation that FEMSA staff, technical staff, are pretty darn good at moving things forward after the advisory committee meets. It appears that something's occurring after it leaves their technical office um, to that rulemaking. I don't know exactly what it is. is but does OMB? add to the delays? I'm sure that there is some with OMB, uh, but I, it appears that there may be things beyond FIMSA within the department that may also be holding things back a little bit. I don't know where the uh, obstacle is, but I can tell you that the industry is very frustrated. We like certainty. It's how often do you have the industry sending in letters to the secretary asking for them to move a rulemaking forward? Okay. And we've been doing that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sames, in your written testimony, you highlight that every natural gas distribution system is different in terms of design, use, age, um, location, external risks, operating history, current operating conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Could you please talk about how, as a result of these differences, uh, prescriptive regulations that uh, take uh, basically a one-size-fits-all approach might not be the best idea. Thank you for the question. Distribution lines are really different from the interstates and the liquid. You have, for example, 
on distribution, you have plastic, you have steel, you have coated steel, you have bare steel, you have all these different materials that were put in over the ages. You also have different pressures and different sizes. It's just very unique compared to everything else. So when you get a prescriptive regulation, it doesn't take any of that into account. And I'll give you an example. Um, atmospheric corrosion surveys are done every three years. Now, if you're in a desert environment, you may not need an atmospheric corrosion survey every three years. However, if you're along the ocean, you probably need it more frequently, which is why it's important to have not only those prescriptive regulations, but also the risk-based regulations that we get through integrity management. That kind of balances things out a bit. Okay. Um, on the first panel, I asked about the role states like Michigan, uh, which have robust inspection programs themselves, play in pipeline safety, uh, specifically their uh, coordination with PHMSA. Uh, has this model helped your uh, Michigan utilities meet higher safety standards at lower regulatory burden as they invest in transitioning away from the old cast iron or steel distribution pipes? I think it has, because the, the local inspectors know the environment, they know the operators, they're spending a lot of time with the distribution operators, and that allows them to collectively move safety forward in a way that's the lowest cost to the customers. Um, the members that I have, they're all publicly traded utilities for the most part, which means that their rates are going through the commissions and it really is a partnership. How do you improve safety? How do you do things the right way at the lowest cost to the customer and the least burden? And they should have a better grasp on the situation. Correct, because they're there. They live and work in the same communities that we're serving. Right. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Sorry, thank you very much. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Black, earlier uh, you indicated that you know there were concerns about attacks on pipelines, and I and I share that. And I understand you also have indicated in speaking with Mr. Latta uh, that uh, you know one of the things we can do is to have voluntary compliance and so forth. But one of my concerns is, is as you heard me uh, at, on the previous panel, is we got pipelines going in the ground, you know, as we speak or in the process. They're not in the ground yet. We, once we get them in the ground, we're not going to put new technology, you know, we're not going to say dig it up five years from now and put in the new technology. And so the concern is why aren't the, the companies putting those pipelines in the ground now, putting in the technology? And again, there may be others, but, uh, you know, I had a demonstration of, of what could be used with the fiber optics. And of course, you'd have to have some broadband in the area, so we'd have to work on that. But but the fiber optics that will tell you if somebody is, if there's a leak that just occurs naturally, or if somebody's making an attack on a pipeline that's underground, they can see it, you know, live action and get out there and do something about it before the harm you indicated, which I agree with you. There can be harm to the community. You know, it's not just about stopping the pipeline. There can be an environmental risk. There's the risk of, of explosion or fire or whatever. So if the industry's not already doing it, it seems to me that would be smart. In fact, as a recovering attorney, let me posit that because that technology is out there, the gas companies might very well be at risk of having not used the best equipment and may have some liability damages in the future. So why aren't they doing it? And that makes me worry that voluntary doesn't work and that we may need to have, you know, regulatory that says, you know, if there's something out there that increases public safety, we ought to do it. What say you? Uh, we're excited about leak detection uh, mm -hmm. technology development. Uh, I know operators uh, are talking with vendors about technologies to see, sniff, and hear signs of small leaks, which are the hardest ones to detect. That can include acoustic smart balls, fiber optic cables. I've heard of uh, copper cables with conductors uh, PHMSA conducted a study on leak detection technologies as a result of a mandate from Congress. Uh, we heard what you alluded to on the first panel. Uh, sometimes the claims of performance, uh, we're not sure yet about how they will do uh, road testing. So operators are having those conversations right now and hoping to be able to have confidence in those technologies. I'm aware of several pilot programs, uh, not in a DOT pilot, but in a company sense, where they're testing some of those new technologies. Uh, we think the pilot program will help. 
uh, an operator work with PHMSA and try and implement, hey, this is how we want to do for leak detection. So Are you okay on that? But here's the problem that my constituents, and there's two coming through Virginia. One comes directly through my district. Another one's a little bit further north. Okay, great. You do a pilot project. Wouldn't it make more sense to go ahead and put that in the ground now? Because once the pilot project comes back and says, yep, it works, they're not going to dig up the, the, the corridor over hundreds of miles and suddenly put down that technology that works. So aren't we, if we had something that already could do that, and you said, well, the new stuff doesn't work any better than the old stuff, I'd say, okay, let's wait and see. Or, but we don't have anything that will give us that detection. And at least with the one technology, and again, I admit there are others that, that are probably out there, it changes the temperature of the ground. They can tell immediately if, if there's a, a, a leak out there. And it would seem to me that, that the companies would want to do this and put it down in advance. And then if you needed software upgrades down the road, you might be able to do that a whole lot easier than, I mean, the, the ditches are dug right now and they're laying the pipe. Why aren't they doing it? And that's what causes calls into question for me, uh, voluntary versus us having some regulations. Now, if it's going to take us 20 years to get the regulations, that ain't going to work either. I'm not sure there is an answer to that, Mr. Black. Let me go to Ms. Sames for, for something different because you've referenced it, I think, but the finalizing of the rulemaking on the automatic shutoff valves uh, and remote controlled shutoff valves, which to me makes a lot of sense, and I think that's the one you're asking them to hurry up and get it done. But can you explain for the public the difference between the transmission and distribution systems and what considerations need to be made on these auto shutoffs for each of those? Sure. So automatic and remotely controlled valves, uh, we're putting them on our intrastate transmission. I can't speak to the interstates, but we're putting them on our intrastate where we have like what I will call consistent pressure. The problem with automatic shutoff valves is they sense a pressure drop, which means that if, if you have pressure fluctuations in the line, it's gonna shut off and now you're shutting off customers, which is why they tend not to work as you get further downstream. You have too many pressure fluctuations because people are turning on their stoves, they're turning on their furnaces, they're, they're using more natural gas, which is sucking the gas from the system, which is dropping the pressure. Um, we're very supportive of them um, in many instances where you don't have those pressure fluctuations. Well, how about the, and I know you said it was, you were doing intra, but how about that 42 inch pipe coming through my district? Wouldn't that work better there? I cannot speak to that one, sir. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, and gentlemen. And I want to thank all the witnesses for your patience and for your participation in today's hearing. And I want to also remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questioning for the record. <clears throat> which will be answered by the witnesses who have appeared before the subcommittee. And I ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. Uh, and this, uh, we have a, a unanimous consent request to enter into uh, the following, into the record, the following uh, information, a letter from the American Public Gas Association, a letter from the Interstate Natural Gas Association of America, a letter from the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, and a letter from the Alliance for Innovation and Infrastructure. With the, without objection, so ordered. And the chair now uh, uh, adjourn this committee at this time. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you.